now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. What else would you expect for April Fool's Day but comedies? And that's what we're going to have this time around with J. Carol Nash as Luigi in Life with Luigi. I'll have an episode of My Favorite Husband starring Lucille Ball and Richard Denning. Ezra Stone as Henry Aldrich in The Aldrich Family. Avalon Time with the best clown of all, Red Skelton. And... Claudia. That's all straight ahead on this Monday. It is April 1st, April Fool's Day, uh, 92nd day of the year, 274 days till we get to the end of the year. A couple of Superman actors born on this date, an actress who played two different roles in two different Superman adventures, and a Jimmy Olsen. I'll let you think about that as we go on here and remind you that it was on this date in 1826. Samuel Morey patented the internal combustion engine. The Wrigley Company founded in Chicago on this date in 1891. 1924, Adolf Hitler sentenced to five years in jail for his participation in the Beer Hall Putsch, a failed coup d'etat. However, he spent only nine months in jail, during which he wrote the book Mein Kampf. In 1933, the recently elected Nazis under Julius Streicher organized a one-day boycott of all Jewish businesses in Germany, ushering in the series of anti-Semitic acts that would become known as the Holocaust. In 1945, Operation Iceberg, U.S. troops landed on Okinawa in the final campaign of the war. 1946, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake near the Aleutian Islands just up uh, up by uh, uh, Alaska, created a tsunami that struck the Hawaiian Islands, 159 killed in Hawaii. Yeah, those tsunamis can be mean. In 1948, military forces under the direction of Soviet-controlled government in East Germany set up a land blockade of West Germany. In 1954, President Dwight David Eisenhower authorized the creation of the Air Force Academy in Colorado. Air Force Academy, founded on this date, uh, authorized on this date in 1954, I should say. The soap opera General Hospital debuted on this date in 1963, and the Department of Transportation began operations in 1967. President Nixon signed the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act into law, requiring Surgeon General's warnings on tobacco products and banning cigarette advertisements on TV and radio in the U.S. starting on the following January 1st. Uh, And yes, that was a dark day for much broadcasting because a lot of money came from those advertisements. And what is even more interesting is they're upping the uh, ante on those warnings, making them more graphic. It's uh, And yet people will still continue to smoke. I remember people who said, well, when cigarettes get to a dollar a pack, I'll quit. And they're still going. 1976, Apple Computer formed by Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. 1979, President Carter visited the site of the Three Mile Island nuclear facility disaster and following a tour spoke to reporters. Primary and overriding, overriding concern for all of us is the health and the safety of the people of this entire area. As I've said before, if we make an error, all of us want to err on the side of extra precautions 
and extra safety. Carter said radiation levels near the facility were quite safe, but he cautioned that officials there faced critical decisions on how to dissipate a radioactive gas bubble. Incidentally, Carter attended nuclear power school in the Navy. His father passed away, and the former president resigned his commission prior to the completion of the training. So the mythology that President Carter was a nuclear scientist is false, but he probably had a better understanding than most when it comes to nuclear power. 1987, President Reagan spoke to members of the College of Physicians in Philadelphia about the threat of AIDS. The Public Health Service has issued an information and education plan for the control of AIDS. The federal role must be to give educators accurate information about the disease. Now, how that information is used must be up to schools and parents, not government. But let's be honest with ourselves. AIDS information cannot be what some call value neutral. After all, when it comes to preventing AIDS, don't medicine and morality teach the same lessons? Among other things the president spoke of during that conversation, other issues plaguing medicine, medical costs, including the need for malpractice insurance and tort reforms, things which still, as of 2024, have not happened. 2001, an EP-3E U.S. Navy plane collided with the Chinese People's Liberation Army fighter jet. They were intercepted by two People's Republic of China fighter aircraft. There was contact between one of the Chinese aircraft and the EP-3, and that caused uh, enough damage for the U.S. aircraft to issue a mayday signal. And they diverted to the Hainan Island in PRC. Now, the Navy crew made that emergency landing. They were detained until a statement was delivered by the U.S. government regarding the incident. The exact phrasing of the document intentionally ambiguous and allowed both countries to save face while diffusing a potentially volatile situation between two militarily strong regional states. And that really is as close as we've come to war in a long, long time. Oh, it was in 2004. Retired truck driver J.R. Tiplett claimed a $235 million mega, mega Millions lottery prize. He told his reporters about checking those numbers. I said, sweetheart, we've got that number. And she kind of broke down, got down on her knees and said a little prayer, thank the Lord. Now, while Tiplett said the prize was no big deal and he'd spend his wisely, his wife Peggy told reporters she was going to shop till she dropped. Passing away on this date in history, Scott Joplin, composer, Maple Leaf Rag. The motion picture Sting used his The Entertainer as the theme. Also, singer Marvin Gaye passing away on this date. We lost Jim Jordan back in 1988. Fibber McGee. John Forsyth, Charlie's Angels and Bachelor Father passing away on this date. And the man behind Hill Street Blues, L.A. Law, Doogie Howser, M.D., Cop Rock, and NYPD Blue, proving that you can't win them all. Uh, Stephen Boccio passing away on this date. Birthdays on this date in history include composer Sergei Rachmaninoff, Lon Chaney Sr., Wallace Beery, Gordon Jump from WKRP in Cincinnati, actress Debbie Reynolds, and from all those wonderful MGM musicals, Jane Powell, all born on this date in history. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. You remember her from Love Story with Ryan O'Neill and also Convoy with Chris Christopherson. Allie McGraw, still beautiful at 85 years of age. Uh, she was, uh, and we mentioned Superman. She was Lana Lang in Superman 3, Martha Kent on the TV show Smallville, Annette O'Toole, 72 years old, Sam Huntington, who was Jimmy Olsen in Superman Returns, he's 42 today. Pro wrestler, third generation, Randy Orton, I, I in fact watched uh, his grandfather in wrestling, and that's, that's something to realize how old you really are. Uh, Randy Orton is 44 years old today. From Saturday Night Live and Mad TV, Taryn Killam is 42. And country singer Hilary Scott of Lady A, used to be Lady Antebellum until they got woke. Uh, Hilary Scott, 
38 today. Those some of the people who celebrate the uh, this uh, first day of April, April Fool's Day, as their birthday. If this is your birthday, hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say happy birthday to you. And on this April Fool's Monday Classic Radio Theater, we're going to start off with some comedies, and we'll have a full uh, two and a half hours of comedies here. Starting off with J. Carroll Nash, Life with Luigi, 72 years ago, April 1st, 1952, and the April Fool's Joke. Are you suffering with anxiety, depression, PTSD, an eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem? If it's causing problems at work or with your family, get help now. At Insight Mental Health and Wellness, we help and treat all types of depression and mental issues. We will help you use your insurance to get away from it all, to a beautiful sunny and tranquil vacation-like environment, so you can recharge yourself. And with the Family Medical Leave Act, you could take the time off you need from work. Plus, with the Affordable Care Act, your treatment could be 100% covered. If you're suffering from any kind of anxiety, depression, PTSD, eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem, use your insurance and get away from it all. Come to sunny California. Call Insight Mental Health and Wellness now. 800-281-8944. 800-281-8944. 800-281-8944. That's 800-281-8944. And on this April Fool's Day Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, let's get started this brand new month off with some comedy from J. Carol Nash as uh, Luigi Basco, Life with Luigi, 72 years ago, April Fool's Day, 1952. We delay the start of our scheduled program. We have delayed the start of our scheduled program to bring you a special bulletin from CBS Radio News on the presidential primaries in Nebraska and Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, in the Republican primary, Taft 9,257, Stassen 5,549, Warren 4,510. In the Democratic primary in Wisconsin, Keepover 3,321, Jerome Fox uninstructed 367, Charles Broughton, Truman Draft, 322. In the Nebraska primaries, only 87 votes have been counted. They show Taft and Kefauver leading the Republican and Democratic tickets. But of course, this is only the first fragmentary count. Stay tuned to CBS Radio for further returns. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum invite you to enjoy life, Life with Luigi, a comedy show created by Cy Howard, directed by Mac Benoff, and starring that celebrated actor, Mr. J. Carroll Nash, with Alan Reed as Pasquale. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum are glad to bring you Life with Luigi because they feel it's a friendly, good-natured show that offers you relaxation and enjoyment. And you know, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum offers you relaxation and enjoyment, too. It's pleasant to chew on a smooth piece of Wrigley's Spearmint whether you're working, shopping, listening to your radio, or doing just about anything. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good, it's refreshing, and the good, easy chewing gives you comfort and satisfaction. So chew Wrigley Spearmint Gum often, every day. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Now, Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum brings you Luigi as he writes another letter describing his adventures in America to his Mama Basco in Italy. Dear Mamma Mia, it's April 1st today in America, and they got a big saying. April showers bring me flowers. Well, with me, April 1st brings a gas, electric, and a telephone bills. <laughs> Come on, Mommy, I wish you could see all the mail I'm got this morning. Besides the bill, I'm got a lot of advertisements, like one card that says, bring this to your grocery, he's going to give you two bars of soap for free, if you give him 25 cents. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, yes, it's a one or more letter I got to which you was an overlonger to me, and I'm open up for by mistake. With some a letter for my country, I'm on a Pasquale, and is I had the one dollar inside. As soon as I clean up in my antique shop, I'm gonna go into Pasquale Spaghetti Palace and I give him his letter. <laughs> Don't get it, Pasquale. See, what was the idea of shoving your own letter under this Basco's door? Lefty, today is April Foolish Day, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you are. That's it. That little pop squeak always likes to celebrate all the American holidays, so I'm going to let him celebrate April Foolish Day. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was so smart, I should have win me the Putzel Prize. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what do you want me to do? Just to do like I told you, Lefty. Don't ask so many questions. This is going to be the easiest of five bucks you made since the prohibition. No, that ain't... <laughs> quiet, quiet. Here comes the little greenhorn now. Uh, you better sit down at one of those tables and don't forget the signal. Okay, okay. Oh, hello, Pasquale. Hello, little banana nose. <laughs> You're looking beautiful in this morning, Luigi. Shoes all shined up, pants and nice and pressed, bow tie, face shining, and long and curly hair just begging for a poodle haircut. <laughs> well, Pasquale, I'm, I'm glad you feel so good today. Here, I, I open up one of your letters by mistake. What? Quick, hide the letter. Hurry up. Huh? What's the matter, Pasquale? I'm, I'm did something wrong? Worse than a wrong, a wronger. Open up for somebody else's mail is a terrible crime in America. Huh? Violation of the refrigerator law. <laughs> What's this refrigerator law? Using the mails to defrost. <laughs> You're making a joke. I have my no, <laughs> no, Luigi. I'm just telling you, you should always remember. Break somebody's window. Pick a fight with a cop. Or rob a bank if you want to. But never touch anybody else's mail. And you know why? Why? Because right away the FBI marks you AWOL. AWOL? What does this mean? Alien what opens the letters. <laughs> All I did was, was, was make a little mistake. Little mistakes is no yeah. excuse to the law. It's a lucky thing you open my letter, not a stranger's. Now, uh, slip me the damage and nobody should see. I'd like to hear the letter, Pasquale, just like I'm a fan of it. Ah, that's from Mr. Roberts, my steadiest customer. He says, uh, dear Mr. Pasquale, enclose a fine of $50 of cash, which takes care of my spaghetti bill for March. <laughs> 50 Oh, Pasquale, was only one dollar in his side. What? Luigi, I wouldn't have mind to defend you on a letter open at a charge, but never stealing the money. In America, it's called arson. Arson? <laughs> yes, and over 25 bucks worth is a worse. That's called larson. <laughs> larson? Of course. Now, uh, I couldn't testify against you if you was to be my daughter's husband. Huh? Well, take your pick, arson or arson or a parson. <laughs> you, 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 you're just trying to scare me. Nothing wrong is happening. Nothing wrong is happening, huh? No. Okay. You hear me? Okay. Oh, uh, pardon me, bud. Huh? Uh, who are you? Well, I just happened over here to hold conversation, see? And I happen to be a postal office inspector, see? Postal Office Inspector C. Uh, don't mind him, Mr. Postal Office Inspector. By C, he means a yes. Uh, I guess he didn't really believe you were a real officer. Well, there it is, right on my driver's license. I'm afraid you're in trouble, bud. Trouble? Well, what do you say now, Mr. Know-it-all? Uh, what kind of trouble is he in, Mr. Officer? And please, be good to him. Well, we give him a choice. Five years or ten years? Five out of ten years. Well, Luigi, go ahead. You win the five and ten. Take your pick. <laughs> Mama mia, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go get advice. Goodbye. Hey, come here. i got to make a pinch. Pinch yourself. I'm not going to go to school. <laughs> Goodbye, Alcatraz. <laughs> Ooh, what an April Foolish joke. <laughs> Lefty, you couldn't have acted better if you was at the Labarra Ball. <laughs> hey, here's you five bucks. Hey, thanks, Pasquale. Hey, you got that character real scared. <laughs> Weren't you supposed to tell him the whole thing was just an April Fool's joke? <laughs> That's the way it started out, Lefty, but who knows? Maybe that April Fool could turn my daughter into a June bride. <laughs> Your 
Bob. Quiet, please, class. Please. I'll call the roll. Mr. Basco? Here. Mr. Harwood? Yeah. Mr. Olson? Mr. Schultz? I accept the nomination. Thank you, fellow boobers. And remember my promise. A vote for Schultz in November is a vote for chaos in December. <laughs> Mr. Schultz, that will be enough clowning. Ach, smile, Miss Spalding. It's spring. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. Lovers are humming. The whole world is in tune. You may answer the first question, Mr. Toscanini. <laughs> Me and my big mouth. <laughs> we are studying state capitals today, class. And Mr. Schultz, you... Mr. Basco, what's the matter? Well, Miss Spalding, today I'm, I'm opening up a Pasquale's letter by mistake. Was it supposed to be $50 in a side? I'm found only one. But Pasquale says, ask in a last one or the person in the post office who wants to pinch me. <laughs> oh, Luigi, are you for shimmered? Believe it or not, Schultz, I understood him. Look, Luigi, anybody can make a mistake once in a while and open up a wrong letter. Yo, oh, that's true by him, me. Yo, my nephew once opened up a letter and they sent him away for three. Years. Really? Where was the letter from? His draft board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a gigantic yoke by him. <laughs> Very good, Olsen. Listen to them. Olsen and Horowitz. The United Nations, Martin and Lewis. <laughs> Look, Luigi, I'm sure Pasquale won't make you no trouble. Just forget the whole thing. I think so, too, Mr. Basco. Yeah, but it's a $49 a mission from my envelope. Miss Balding, the inspectors are going to make him in trouble. I could tell it the way he's tried to grab him. Luigi, be practical. Even if the post office inspector was there at the time and he did see everything, they can't do a thing to you unless Pasquale wants to prosecute. Yeah, and for a measly $49, Pasquale wouldn't slap you in the clink, will he? Just, you think he would? Without a doubt. <laughs> Pasquale would kill himself if he could only figure out a way to come back and collect the insurance. <laughs> Mamma mia, then, then, I, then I'm in a big trouble. Shame on you, Mr. Schultz, frightening him like that. Ach, smile, Luigi. I was only trying to make a show. Mr. Basco, the whole thing is just a misunderstanding. You talk to Mr. Pasquale after school, tell him the truth. You found only one dollar in the letter. Yeah, but I've already told him this. Look, Luigi, maybe it dropped out. Did you look all over the store? Yeah, all over. All over. But then you should look again. Leave no stone unturned. That's what they say on the rock pile. <laughs> oh, smile, Luigi. Nothing is going to come from all this. Believe me. Well, sure, should so well, Inspector was there. Pasquale has looked at me very strict. Like he thought I was a lion. I... I'm afraid that maybe he's going to let him put me in jail. Why, that's ridiculous, Mr. Basco. Look, if you're so worried, why don't you go downtown to the main post office, see the officials there, and explain the whole thing to them? Me? Go, go to the post office? Sure, Luigi. Ten million Americans do it every day to fill their fountain pens. <laughs> That's right. You got nothing to lose, Luigi. You ought to be sure. Uh, the truth usually has a way of shining through. That's right. Tell him, tell him you got the letter. You opened it up by mistake. There was one dollar inside, and that's what you gave Pasquale. But it shows you what if the inspector don't believe in me. Well, then you get... Well... Ach, Luigi, stop worrying. We'll visit you in Alcatraz and call the roll every Sunday. <laughs> Before we return to Life with Luigi, here's a suggestion that'll make your daily work a little easier and more enjoyable. Chew refreshing Wrigley Spearmint Gum while you work. You see, chewing on a good, smooth piece of Wrigley Spearmint Gum just naturally helps keep you feeling right. It helps relieve that feeling of tension and pressure, gives you comfort and satisfaction. Then, too, Wrigley Spearmint Gum has a lively, long-lasting, real spearmint flavor that freshens your mouth and helps keep your throat moist. Yes, friends, that little stick of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum can be a real help to you while you're working. Try it and see for yourself. Chew Wrigley Spearmint Gum on the job and see how the pleasant chewing makes your work go smoother and easier. Now let's turn to page two of Luigi Basco's letter to his mother in Italy. Well, 
Well, Mamma me, I'm not got a worst day of my life in front of me. But before I go down to the town to the post office to beg them they should believe me, I'm going to go see Pasquale. Right there now, through the window, I can see he's a calling me somebody. Rosa! Rosa! Rosa, come out of the kitchen. You call me that <laughs> Yes, my little Cupid doll. Tell me, Rosa, did uh, Luigi talk to you yet today? Oh! <laughs> oh, what's the matter, Bambino? Oh, Bobby, you should tell Luigi it's an April Fool joke. He feels terrible. <laughs> sure. And when he feels terrible enough, he might decide to marry you. <laughs> Rosa, this whole thing started as an April Foolish joke, but now the whole thing is bigger than both of us. <laughs> If that's possible. <laughs> Robert! Quiet, here he comes now. Go back in the kitchen. Yes, Robert. No, Pasquale, you, you, you gotta believe me, Pasquale. You gotta. Believe you about what, little cabbage puss? So, Pasquale, Pasquale, you know I didn't take you $49? Sure, Luigi, I know you didn't take the money. How could you? After all, I look at you like my own son. Oh, thank you, Pasquale. Now, give me back the money and I drop the charges. <laughs> but, Pasquale, you, you just said... Never that... mind what I said. Just listen to me. As far as I'm concerned, I'd be willing to forget the whole thing. But that J. Edgar Hoover's a cracking down on letter openers of this year. Yeah, but, Pasquale, I didn't... Luigi, let me warn you. Don't say anything I might hold against you in a court. Court? What the court? Who knows? There's lots of courts. You're in the soup, so I guess they're going to take you to the superior court. <laughs> After all, Luigi, that's a terrible, terrible charge they got against you. Housebreaking into a letter. Pasquale, you don't believe me. You don't believe in Luigi, nothing. Luigi, believe me. I think you're innocent even though you're guilty. <laughs> but in the eyes of the law, you are now what is called a habeas corpus. Habeas corpus? That's, I mean, a half a corpse. <laughs> Pasquale, please. Look, go down to town. Talk to this fellow. Tell him how you was brought to me to America. And, and you don't think I'm going to took your money. Now, is it too late, Luigi? Now you've got a choice of three juries. Uh, there's the grand. That's for people who steal over $1,000. <laughs> then there's the blue ribbon jury, which tries mostly beer cases. And, <laughs> and then, then, Luigi, they got the hung jury. Hung the jury? Yes, they hang you first to the try you later. <laughs> oh, no, Pasquale, now, now I know you're making a joke of him or the whole thing. You don't care what's happening to me. No, no, don't say that to Luigi. I feel very sorry for you. If I was in your boots now, you know what I'd do? I would go down to Lake Michigan, hire one of those half a dollar an hour rowboats, and aim for Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and goodbye. Goodbye, my, my, my good friend. Oh, wait, Luigi. Come back. Where are you going? To the post office to beg you for my life. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many stamps, sir? No, 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 no. Thanks, sir. I'm, I'm going to talk to the boss. Is he in? Oh, you want the superintendent? Huh? What am I going to do with a janitor? <laughs> the superintendent is in charge of this office, sir. Oh, oh he's, a, he's a the biggest of boss, huh? Well, no, no. Above him, there's the fourth assistant postmaster, and his superior is the third assistant postmaster. Then there's the second assistant postmaster, and above him is the first assistant postmaster. And, uh, and uh, he's the biggest, huh? No, no, no. The top man is the postmaster general. Oh, when they get a too big army, is a draft for them, huh? Uh, <laughs> sir, if you tell me what your problem is, I might be able to direct you. Well, uh, Mister, is, is about a letter. I'm, I'm open up by mistake. Oh, oh, do you have the letter? No, I think maybe the inspector is who took it. What inspector? From the post office. Well, do you know his name? Sure, Mister Lefty. Lefty. Oh. I, I think you want to see the chief inspector, Mister Simmons, sir. He's in room two fourteen upstairs. Oh, thank you, and and I, I'm, I'm going to buy. Three stamps, please. Oh, good, good. What kind? Any kind. Eh? I, I, I don't like it to come into your post office and take up your time without giving you some little business. <laughs> oh, 
Excuse me, Mr. Inspector. Hmm? Can I come inside the office? I, I'm, I'm going to ask you something. All right. What can I do for you, sir? My name is Luigi Basco, and, and I'm coming to tell you about Pasquale's letter, which I'm opened up by mistake, but there wasn't no $49 in his sight. Just a $1 bill with the Mr. Washington as a picture. Believe me, that was all that was in Well, the... let's see if we can't get some facts down. Your name, please? Hi, Luigi Basco. How do you spell that? Luigi Basco, that's a big L and a big B. Everything else is a tiny with a two dots on the top of I I. <laughs> Luigi Basco, okay. Address? At 21 in North Hollister Street. Is that Chicago 1? You mean there's a two Chicago? <laughs> I meant the zone number, Mr. Basco. Oh, that's a... That's the number of 22. Oh, now then, Mr. Basco, calm down. Begin at the beginning and tell me the whole story. Well, I'm at the beginning. Pasquale's letter was a coming to me by mistake, and I'm up and up by mistake. And your inspector was a My there. inspector? What was his name? Mr. Lefty. Hmm, his name isn't familiar. Uh, what do he look like? He's, uh, he's a water green, a pants, a check, a coat, a suede shoes, a big cigar. I think he's a work on a railroad sometimes. <laughs> On the railroad? Yeah, in his hand there was a carry news of paper says uh, tips at the track. <laughs> There's no such inspector working out of this office. Now, Mr. Basco, since the department has already taken steps in your case, I'm afraid my hands are tied. Oh, then please, please, take the ropes off. Please help me. I'm an at the the citizen, and I'm not going to want to get into trouble with the government. Uh, Mr. Basco, I can't do a thing for you. And then maybe you're going to talk to Pasquale, huh? Tell him I'm a didn't take the money. Tell him Mr. That Basco, I... you're just wasting time now. Mr. Chief, I'm a promise you. If, if you help me, I'm going to help you back. I'm going to write to my mama three times a day, special delivery, air and mail. You're going to make so much money from me, you're going to retire in one year. <laughs> Mr. Basco, for the last time, there is nothing I can do for you. Now go home and wait till the department sends for you. Yes, Mr. Chief. But don't worry. I'm still going to buy my stamps from you. <laughs> Hello, Rosa. Oh. <laughs> What's the matter, Rosa? You got a toothache? Papa told me you were going to hire a rowboat and row to Italy. And you was, uh, you was uh, worried about me, Rosa? Yeah. It's a half a dollar now, and I know you haven't got enough money for the whole trip. <laughs> Rosa, I'm in a terrible, terrible trouble. No, Luigi, you're not. Huh? The whole thing's an April Fool's joke. Papa told me. Ep April Fool? You mean it? You mean it, Pascal? He said never had a fifty dollars in that. No, day. Papa slipped the letter under your door. But 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 is that an inspector? That's Lefty from the pool room. Papa gave him five dollars to be an inspector. Mama, 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 yeah. How rusty you done a not, but but you just the government back America. Oh, Rossi, you, you never was a look so good to me like you look right now. Oh, <laughs> and Rossi, Rossi, I'm, I'm going to kiss you. Oh. And your birthday. Oh. Oh. Hey, look, Rossi. Rossi, you want to help me play a little, a little, a little joke on your papa? What kind of joke, Luigi? April the Fool of Joke, Rossi. Well, all right, but... Please don't tell Papa I told you. No, don't worry. First time I got to see Chief Inspector, then I'm going to see some of my friends. Then it's going to start all of the fun. Oh, yeah. Luigi. What? Are you really going to kiss me on my birthday? When is your birthday, Rosa? Next December. You got my promise. <laughs> What's this about Luigi? Yo, did he really run away? What a crazy kid. Really, this is suicide note he left to me after he died. <laughs> oh, let me see that, Pasquale. Dear Pasquale, you was right. I got it no choice, so I'm going to hire a rowboat and row to Italy. Ah, Yemeni, he is a brave man. Yes, I hope the tide is with him. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here, Pasquale, you finish the letter. I ain't got the heart to. All right. <coughs> Friends, don't be too hard with Pasquale. He thinks I really stole his $49. Oh, listen, you stupid letter. I don't think. The whole thing is just a fool joke. What? Pasquale, you have a very stupid, cruel sense of humor. That's right. <laughs> the sense will reach you 5,000 miles in a rowboat. And that's carrying a joke too far. <laughs> Who figured it would take the whole thing so serious? I, I only... Just a plain little April Fool's joke. Schultz, what else did they write? He wrote a P.S. That's a standard for Pasquale. <laughs> P.S. Everything I got in the world, I leave to the best friend I ever had. Pasquale. <laughs> don't, don't, Schultz. That's enough. Read on, Schultz, please, read on. <laughs> read more. <laughs> Wait, I, I gotta wring out my handkerchief. <laughs> Schultz, what's gonna happen with Luigi? Ach, Pasquale, what it's got to be, it's got to be. What? You know, we got the thing in the delicatessen business. If you were born to be a salami, you'll never wind up in the army. <laughs> very funny, Schultz, very funny. <laughs> oh, you were all with the genius, with the yolk, Schultz. <laughs> oh, stop it there, you crazy maroons, you. <laughs> Can you stand there and laugh for when Luigi might be floating right now on the bottom of the ocean? Ach, stop tying on so much, Pasquale. It ain't as if Luigi was the last fella in the world for Rosa. That's the trouble. He was. <laughs> I gotta call up with the police department, the fire department. Oh, Pasquale, come here. Let me go. All right. Which one of you is Pasquale? Huh? Who's it is? Lefty, what do you do with this fellow? Jig is up, Pasquale. I'm what? Chief Inspector Simmons, United States Post Office, and your Confederate Lefty here has already confessed and incriminated you. Hey, he's not to criminate to me. I, I didn't do nothing. Mr. Pasquale, it's a criminal offense to use the mails as a medium for practical jokes. That's a lie. I never slipped that letter under Luigi's door, and I got a 12 witnesses who didn't see me do it. <laughs> it's too bad Luigi ain't here to testify against you, Pasquale. But I am alive huh? in my own way. Uh, 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 who said that? What, what, what? Who said what, Pasquale? Pasquale? Give up, Pasquale. Uh, uh, Tell them how you was killed me. Uh, he's here. Who, oh, Pasquale? Ooh, yeah, Pasquale. Who? No, he didn't hear nobody. Luigi. That's about you all deaf. Don't you hear him? Mr. Inspector, you heard him. Mr. Pasquale. It's just your conscience. My, my, my conscience. No, 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 it can't be. Yes, it can be. What? Well, who's the doctor? Hello from Hollywood to all of you. This is the Well of Parsons, my first exclusive. Mr. Pasquale killed Mr. Luigi Bosco. Shame, shame on him. <laughs> Luella Parsons. If she's to know, everybody's to know. All right, take him away, Inspector. I killed him. I killed him. Take him away. Hey, for the fall of Pascal. Luigi. Luigi. You was in the closet all the time. Sure, and I was talking in this empty milk about the like of this, you see? Can't fast, Pascal. Can't fast. Uh, I knew it all the time, Luigi. You never fooled me once. <laughs> Say, where's the Luella Parsons? Where's Luella Parsons? Yeah. I'm a no no. Wasn't she in the closet with you? No. Oh. <laughs> No, you can tell me. Where is Miss Barton? <laughs> what a show, I'm a no no. I'm, I'm a no even to hear her voice. Can I show the defense of it? <laughs> In just a minute, we'll explain the mystery of Luella Parsons' voice. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's episode of Life with Luigi. 
And they want to remind you that you'll find Wrigley's Spearmint Gum a friendly, helpful companion to take with you wherever you go. At work, in your car, out shopping, no matter where you happen to be, you can slip a stick of refreshing Wrigley Spearmint Gum in your mouth and enjoy some mighty good chewing. Wrigley Spearmint freshens your taste, sweetens your breath, and the chewing action helps keep your teeth clean and bright. So chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum from time to time every day. Enjoy that delicious Wrigley Spearmint flavor and enjoy the good smooth chewing. Get a few packages of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum and carry a package or two with you wherever you go. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum invite you to be sure to listen next week at this time when Luigi Basco writes another letter to his mama Basco in Italy. Life with Luigi is a Cy Howard production. Pat Burton is associate producer. The script is written by Mac Benoff and Lou Derman and directed by Mr. Benoff. J. Carol Nash is starred as Luigi Basco and Alan Reed as Pasquale, Hans Conrad as Joe, Jody Gilbert as Rosa, Mary Schiff as Miss Balding, Joe Forte as Horowitz, and Ken Peters as Olsen. The music is under the direction of Lud Gluskin. Friends, now we can clear up the mystery of Miss Luella Parsons' voice. It came from CBS Radio. In fact, right from Luigi's closet. And we wish to thank her for her appearance in our program tonight. Luella's new program of outstanding Hollywood news starts tonight on CBS Radio immediately after this program. We hope you'll all stay tuned for the Luella Parsons Program. This is the CBS Radio Network. Well, how's that for a cross-show plug? (laughs) From 72 years ago, April 1st, 1952, Life with Luigi here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Up next, we will check in with Lucille Ball and Richard Denning in uh, their April Fool's Day jokes. My favorite husband is next. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. That's 800-515-6302. No gold here, but we'll have copper. As in that shade of red that Lucille Ball's hair always was. Uh, up next, My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball, Richard Denning. From uh, April Fool's Day, 1949, 75 years ago. And uh, lipstick appears to be a problem. It's time for My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Yes, it's the new Gay Family series starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning. Brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O pudding. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O tapioca pudding. Yes, sir. And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning as Liz and George Cooper, two people who live together and like it. As we look in on the Coopers tonight, George hasn't returned home from work, and Liz is in the kitchen talking to Katie, the maid. Do you know what day this is, Katie? Yes, Mrs. Cooper, it's Friday. Yes, but it's also April Fool's Day, and I just thought I'd warn you that I put an exploding cigarette in that package in the living room. 
Well, why warn me? Do you think I snitch cigarettes out of your living room? Oh, why, no, Katie, but I noticed that you're smoking, and I just didn't want I to... might not make much here, Mrs. Cooper, but I can still buy my own cigarettes. <laughs> I don't stoop to petty things like stealing them. I'm sorry, Katie. It's just that you have a cigarette in your mouth, and I wanted to be sure you didn't get the exploding one. I accept your apology. <laughs> Never mind the laughing, Mrs. Cooper. Help me find my upper plate. <laughs> oh, there's one joke gone bluey. Well, this trick won't miss. Well, what are you doing, Mrs. Cooper? Kissing the handkerchief? Yeah, I want to smear it all up good with lipstick and slip it in George's pocket. I don't get it. Don't you see? I'll make some excuse and get him to take out his handkerchief, and then I'll just step back and let him try to explain the lipstick on it. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Cooper, that's an awful thing to do to anybody. Yeah, it's a dirty, sneaky thing to do, and I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> but how are you going to plant it on him? You're going to help me. Now, when he comes in, I'll stop him in the hall, and you reach out through the kitchen door and put the handkerchief in his overcoat pocket. <laughs> oh, I feel like one of those, uh, what do they call pickpockets? A regular drip. <laughs> That's dip Now get ready, Katie He'll be home any minute Here's the handkerchief uh, Here you are, Mr. Anderson A chocolate malt Oh, hi, Mr. Cooper. Hello, Felix. How's the drugstore business tonight? Oh, business is fine, Mr. Cooper. Everybody's sick. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, uh, I want to play an April Fool joke on my wife, and I was wondering if you sell any of those uh, novelty gags. <laughs> like a glass of dribbles or, or itching powder or candy with soap in it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't have any. <laughs> Oh, that's too bad. Hey, why don't you try Miller's? They got some swell-loaded cigars. Well, that'd be fine, Felix, but Liz gave up cigars for Lent. <laughs> oh. Well, you might try the trick I played on my fiancé, Imogene. We're engaged. Uh, I gathered that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I told her I'd lost my job and didn't have any money. <laughs> Just as a joke. Did she fall for it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> she gave me my ring back. <laughs> Hey, you know, that's a good idea, Felix. I'll tell Liz I lost my job at the bank. <laughs> yeah. Do you think she'll give you your ring back? No, no, that's too much to hope for. <laughs> but it'll be a lot of fun. Oh, here comes George now, Katie. Don't forget the handkerchief. Is that you, George? Yes, dear. It's me. I'm home. Why, George, what's the matter? You look sick. Are you ill? No, Liz, I... You got hit by a car. No, honey, You I... were robbed. No, darling. You've I... been poisoned? No, I... Well, don't just stand there like a lump of putty. Tell me what happened. Liz, I lost my job. Oh, is that all? Is that all? Oh, George, what's a job as long as it isn't your health? If you'd broken your leg or something, it would be... You lost your job! <laughs> oh, why couldn't you just have broken your leg? How did it happen? They fired me, Liz. I've foreclosed my last widow. They're already scraping my name off the door. I can't believe it. Yes, when I left, it was already down to George Coop. <laughs> but, George, you've been with the bank ten years. I know. Everybody felt terrible about it. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. Well, I should hope not. It even caused a run on the bank. It did? Yes. They were all crying so hard people thought the bank had failed. <laughs> well, why, George? Why did they fire you? Well, the bank examiner discovered I'd done something wrong. <gasps> George, you don't mean that you... Yes, Liz, I put new points in the bank pens. <laughs> <laughs> April Fool! <laughs> you mean you didn't lose your job? Oh, no, of course not. Boy, did you fall for that. <laughs> George Cooper, that was a dirty trick. 
<laughs> well, you're not mad, are you, Liz? I sort of half expected you to play an April Fool's trick on me. Me? I wouldn't stoop to such a low trick. <laughs> Mrs. Cooper, can I see you a minute? I'll be right there, Katie. George, uh, give me your handkerchief a minute, will you? Uh, well, wait till I take my overcoat off. No, don't take your coat off yet. Well, why not? It's warm in here. Oh, well, then why don't you take out your handkerchief and mop your brow? Liz, do you feel well? I feel fine. Matter of fact, I, I feel like playing a game. What game? Drop the handkerchief. <laughs> I think you've blown your top, Liz. George, kiss me. Yeah, do you mind if I take my coat off first? No, kiss me right now. <laughs> Liz, if you're driving at something, I want to... Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Phew. Now I've got to take my coat off. Oh, look, I got lipstick on you. Give me your handkerchief, darling. No, oh, never mind. I'll take it off for the cleaning. Oh, give me your handkerchief. There's one sticking out of your coat pocket. Well, that's funny. I never carry a handkerchief there. Let's have it. I don't know how this got in my... Uh-oh, oh, that's not a handkerchief. Let me see it. It's uh, not a handkerchief. What is it? Uh, my shirt tail. I, I have a hole in my pocket. <laughs> Tail, how can you hold it behind your back like that? It isn't easy. <laughs> Let me see that, George. Why, it is a handkerchief. And it's got lipstick on it. Uh, no, it hasn't, Liz. Honest, it, it, that's not lipstick. Then what is it? Well, it, the, the truth is I had a nosebleed today. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, that's it. I had a nosebleed. Your blood type seems to be tangy. Well, Liz, I might as well tell you the truth Don't strain yourself Mrs. Cooper, come here a minute, will you? Just a minute, Katie Well, George, have you thought of a good truth yet? Yes I, I mean, uh, this is the way it happened uh, You know Miss Johnson, that homely, old maid secretary down at the bank Yes hmm. Well, I accidentally bumped into her And some of her lipstick got on my cheek she doesn't even come up to your shoulder. What was she doing, walking on stilts? Well, no. You don't really expect me to believe that, do you? All right. I'll tell you the truth. I haven't the slightest idea where that lipstick came from. You think what you want to. I don't care to discuss it anymore. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> April Fool! <laughs> About. That's my lipstick. I put some of it on your handkerchief and I planted it on you. <laughs> well, you didn't fool me. I knew it all the time. Oh, sure. Oh, George, you were so funny. Now we're even. Oh, husbands are so silly. They have such guilty consciences. Don't you know I'd trust you, George, no matter how bad things looked. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> Mrs. Cooper. Oh, I forgot. Come in, Katie. I'll be right back, darling. What do you want, Katie? It's about your April Fool joke, Mrs. Cooper. <laughs> oh, it worked beautifully. You should have seen George's face. You mean you've already done it? Yes, why? Well, how could you? I didn't put the hand... Katie! <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? Well, he didn't stand close enough to the door. I couldn't slip the handkerchief in his pocket. Oh, no, Katie. I've still got it. Here it is. What are you doing, honey? Come on into the living room and talk to me, baby. Don't baby me, you monster. All right, George. How did the lipstick get on that other handkerchief? I don't know. I thought you said you trusted me, Liz. I did, and look what happened. <laughs> I thought it was a scream when I had one handkerchief with lipstick on it. Two of them ought to give you a real laugh. You should be ashamed of yourself, George Cooper. Look, Liz, I've been framed. Ha! Outside of this house, I don't know what a kiss is. Scientists don't know what electricity is either, but they know how to use it. Oh, stop. I thought you were the one who wasn't jealous. I'm not. I merely have a healthy curiosity. Well, for the last time, I don't know where that lipstick came from. Ha! <laughs> now, look, Liz, I'm getting fed up. Do you believe me or not? All right, George. All right. I believe you. And that's the last time we'll hear of it. Yes, George. Good. Now, let's go to bed. All right. George? What? Who was she? Oh! 
George. George, wake up. Hmm? What's the matter? Was it the blonde cashier at the bank? Oh, Liz, this is the third time you've waked me up. Now cut it out. Was it Anita Aaron, Elaine Abbott, Dora Allberg, the A1 Cleaning Company? No, it couldn't be them. Where are you getting those names? Out of the phone book. And I'm going to find out who it was if I have to go through the whole book. I'll go to sleep. All right, Cooper, start talking. What, what are you doing, Liz? Don't shine that bright light in my face. This is the third degree. Now start talking. Who was it? Now stop it, Liz. You, you've been pestering me all night. Now will you please let me get some sleep? Well, all right, George. I won't ask you any more tonight. Thank you. Good night. Oh, no, that isn't the alarm, is it? Yes, and now that it's morning, George, who was it? Uh... Well, seems like everything happens to the Coopers, and that's not just cricket, is it? But say, here's something swell that can happen to your family. You can start right now treating them to delicious Jell-O puddings. Jell-O chocolate, butterscotch, and vanilla puddings. Boy, take it from me, there's something. Rich and distinctive, smooth as cream, chuck full of old-fashioned homemade goodness. Try luscious Jell-O chocolate pudding in this tempting chocolate roll. Just prepare your pudding as directed on the package, reducing the milk to one and three-quarter cups. Cool, spread on a sheet of sponge cake, and roll it up like a jelly roll. It's a grand and glorious dessert treat. Jell-O puddings are so quick and easy to prepare. All you do is add milk and they take about five minutes to cook. Get all three Jell-O puddings tomorrow and find out why more women buy Jell-O puddings than any other prepared puddings in the world. J-E-L-L-O Hey, George. George, wake up. I tell you, I don't know where the lipstick came from. What are you talking about, George? You went to sleep right at your desk. Huh? Oh, oh, hi, Joe. Uh, I, I didn't get any sleep last night. Liz found a handkerchief in my pocket with lipstick on it. Oh, George, you sly <laughs> devil, you. <laughs> I have no idea where it came from. Hey, George, George, this is Joe, not Liz. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> oh, it's a shame. Shame. Yeah. As long as you got arrested, it's too bad you didn't get to enjoy the crime. Very funny. Oh, don't worry, George. Uncle Joe's got a great idea. I'll call Liz and tell her I planted the handkerchief on you for an April Fool's joke. Hey, now you're talking sense. And it's all settled. I'll call right after you get home tonight, and the minute she hangs up, she'll fall into your arms. Good. Oh, oh, say, I almost forgot what I came in here for. Atterbury wants to see you in his office. Yeah, oh, all right. Uh, don't forget to call tonight. I won't. Did you uh, send for me, Mr. Atterbury? Yes, yes. Come in, George boy. I understand you had a little uh, trouble at home last night. Well, uh, yes, but how'd you hear about it? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> things get around. <laughs> oh, you devil, you. Oh, not you, too. I have no idea who put that lipstick on my handkerchief. Of course not. Who was she, boy? <laughs> Listen, I said I don't know. But if I find the moron who put that handkerchief in my pocket, I'll punch him right in the nose. Oh, I don't think you would. Not much I wouldn't. Well, here's my nose. Start punching. Are you the moron? I mean, did you do it? <laughs> April Fool! <laughs> oh, it worked better than I thought. <laughs> well, I should say it did. Liz is furious with me. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> well, she kept me up all night quizzing. Yeah. <laughs> well, frankly, Mr. Atterbury, I don't think it was funny. If you want to see me on business, I'll be in my office. Oh, Goodbye. No, don't go away, mad boy. Oh, that poor guy. <laughs> I ought to do something to straighten it out for him. Mrs. Cooper.
Cooper, you can't stay out here in the kitchen all night. I'm very happy reading this book. I don't care to sit in the same room with you-know-who until he explains how that you-know-what got into his you-know-where. <laughs> you mean you're going to stay here until what's-his-name explains about what you might call it? <laughs> yes. And don't worry about me. I'm not the least bit upset. And I'm enjoying this book. Do you always hold the book upside down when you read it? <laughs> what? Oh, well... I wish I did know where that hanky came from. I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Liz. This is Joe Richley. Oh, hello, Joe. Do you want to speak to George? Hey, well, gosh, I don't know if I dare. I, I hope I haven't caused him any trouble. What do you mean? Well, yesterday was April Fool's, and I put a handkerchief in his pocket with a lot of lipstick on it. You did? Yeah. And then I forgot to go ahead with the trick, and he went home before I remembered. You weren't mad, were you? Me? Mad? Oh, Joe. Well, oh. some women would have blown their tops. Joe, what kind of a wife do you think I am? <laughs> I did see it, and George said he didn't know where it came from, and that was the end of it. Yeah? Sure. Well, I, I just thought I'd call in case anything went wrong. Well, thanks for calling, Joe. George? Yes, Liz? That was Joe Ridgely on the phone. Oh, now do you believe I didn't know where that handkerchief came from? How did you know what he told me? <laughs> I was listening to your end of the conversation, and I put two and two together. Oh. Well, George, I'm sorry. <sighs> oh, that's all right, Liz. I understand. I guess I was just a mean, jealous, nagging wife. Yes, you were. Well, you don't have to agree with me. Oh, now, honey, now, now, don't start crying. Do you forgive me? Well, I, I guess so. Kiss me, George. I promise never to be jealous again. <laughs> Scout's honor. Honey, you just don't appreciate me. I'm as trustworthy and loyal as an old dog. <laughs> George. What? <laughs> Let me sit on your lap, dog <laughs> Oh, darn it, I'll get it Hello Hello, is that you, Liz, girl? Oh, hello, Mr. Atterbury, how are you? Fine, girl, fine But I have some explaining to do to you To me? Yes, it's about a little April Fool joke I played on George Oh, you too. <laughs> I just heard about another one that was played on him. What did you do? Uh, I slipped a handkerchief with lipstick on it in George's pocket. <laughs> Liz? Are you there? I'm here, all right. Didn't you notice anything unusual when you put the handkerchief in George's pocket? Like what? Like finding you were shaking hands with Joe Ridgely? I, I don't know what you mean. I just wanted to be sure you understood, Liz. Oh, I understand perfectly. Oh, then everything is all right. Everything is just ginger peachy. Good. Well, goodbye, girl. Goodbye, boy. <laughs> what was it, Liz? You're back in the doghouse, Rover. <laughs> What's the matter? Another entry has just come in in the George Cooper Alibi Derby. What? Joe Ridgely said he put the handkerchief in your pocket. Now Mr. Atterbury comes up with the same story. Which story do you want me to believe? What well, now, Liz? Which friend has the phony? <laughs> Liz, I can explain. Mr. Atterbury was telling the truth, and Joe was just doing me a favor. Being jealous again. You're darn right I am. Well, what about that scout's honor? Shake hands with an ex-brownie. <laughs> Liz, I've told you the truth. If you don't believe me, I'll treat you like the child that you are and put you over my knee. You wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I? Come on, put over me my down, knee. Put I won't let you... Oh! Oh! <laughs> uh, you're just crying because I hurt your pride. And that isn't all. <laughs> Gee, that hurt. I never got spanked that much when I was little. 
Well, when you were little, there wasn't that much to spank. <laughs> First you smooch other women, then you beat me, and now you say I'm a big fat cow. I admit you're a big fat cow. See, you admit it. <laughs> Well, George, if that's the way you're going to act, there isn't room for both of us under this roof. I'm leaving. George, I said I'm leaving. Goodbye. <laughs> now, don't you try and stop me. Who's stopping? I'm going to leave right now. <laughs> well, I'm leaving. Okay, okay. I really am leaving. <laughs> goodbye. For the last time, I'm leaving. I said goodbye. Goodbye. Next time, I'm going out the door. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you heartless beast. Just for that, I'm leaving. Goodbye. <laughs> Go ahead. Give me another one. And this time, make it a double. I'm going to drown my sorrows. But, Mrs. Cooper, that's your third lemon Coke. <laughs> I know, Felix. I don't care what happens to me. Felix, men are beasts. <laughs> yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> and George Cooper's the biggest beast of all. Well, I always thought he was a great guy. To you, yes. But to me, he's cruel and nasty. Gee whiz. And I've left him forever. Gee whiz. Do you know what he did, Felix? He beat me. Gee whiz. I had a feeling you'd say that. Liz, there you are. Gee whiz, I've been looking all over for you. Don't speak to her, you cad. What? Liz, I didn't think you were serious about leaving. Come on home. Felix, will you tell Mr. Cooper I'm not speaking to him? She's not speaking to you. Oh, look, Liz. Throw I... me, please. <laughs> well, tell her I apologize, and I'd like her to come home with me. He apologizes, and he'd like you to come home with him. I'm not going home to a wife beater. She's not going home to a wife beater. Go oh, for heaven's sake. Go oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> tell Mr. Cooper he's wasting his time. You're wasting your time. I am not. He is not. I refuse to continue this exchange of banalities, and I will consider it a favor if he will remove his person from this vicinity. I refuse to... <laughs> you care for a malt, Mr. Cooper? Now, Liz, cut out this nonsense. Now, Liz, cut out this nonsense. You keep out of this, Felix. You keep out of this, Felix. Oh. <laughs> Cooper that I... Why, George Cooper, how are you? Hello, Charlie. Say, I'm glad I ran into you. I've got your overcoat. What? Yeah, I picked it up by mistake at lunch yesterday. You must have mine. Here's yours. Oh, thanks. Let me see that. Oh, George, it is your coat. I hope you didn't look in the pockets of my coat. I had a heavy date the night before. <laughs> <laughs> George, if, if this is true, what about those other stories, Mr. Atterbury's and Ridgely's? Oh, they were just friends trying to help me out. Oh, George, I'm awfully sorry. Well, you should be. I'll bring your coat down to the bank tomorrow, Charlie. Uh oh, all right, George. Oh, give me a Coke, son. <laughs> George, will you, will you take me with you, please? Well... All right. Oh, thanks, George. You're so wonderful. <laughs> Gee whiz. I'm sure glad they made up. They're swell people, aren't they? I don't know. I never saw them before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How come you had his coat? Search me. He stopped me on the street outside, handed me the coat, gave me ten bucks to come in and say that. <laughs> Yes, 
Yes, Lucille. Well, so long, Robert. I'm off on another session of making the most out of radio. What are you going to do? I'm going to see the world, find out what's going on. Let's see now. Alaska, the Bering Straits, the land of the midnight sun. Mm Mm-hmm. Sounds like fun. That's it. Mr. Soundman, on to the Arctic Ocean. I said on to it, not into it. (laughs) What's the matter? Couldn't you get your bearing straight? (laughs) Uh, Well, Alaska looks pretty good. Bum, 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 well, here comes a great big white bear, and it's singing. Uh, pardon me, what kind of a bear are you? I'm a polar. <laughs> I had to pick up an Alaskan cornball. Uh, say, how come you can talk, bear boy? Well, if I couldn't, how could I say the jello puddings are a trio of treats? Well, you know, you have a very important point there. What else is brewing along the same line? Brewing, get it? <laughs> well, jello chocolate pudding is luscious with deep down chocolatey goodness. Well, I'll bear you out on that. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. I won't say another word. Jello butterscotch pudding has that buttery brown sugar flavor. Oh, oh, oh. Jello vanilla pudding is rich and smooth as cream. Jello puddings are so easy to make, too. All you do is add milk, and they take only about five minutes to cook to a velvety rich perfection. Thank you. You have just heard a program from Alaska where the nights are six months long. Tune in again tomorrow night at half past November and hear our little comedy of Eskimo family life, The Icebergs. Good night, all. <laughs> You have been listening to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning, and based on characters created by Isabel Scott Rory. Lucille Ball will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, Miss Grant Takes Richmond. Be sure to listen to Lucille Ball and My Favorite Husband again next week, presented by... J-E-L-L Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O tap. Fioca puddings. Yes, sir. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Lucille Ball, Richard Denning, my favorite husband. Did, was there a similar skit to that in uh, I Love Lucy? I'm sure there was, uh, because the same writers wrote for my favorite husband as I Love Lucy. Uh, 75 years ago, April 1st, 1949. Tomorrow's classic radio theater will be Studies in Crime with Nick Carter, Master Detective, also Bob Bailey, Virginia Gregg, and Let George Do It, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, another episode of Gangbusters, and uh, we will have uh, an episode of Superman as we get to the first of our series of uh, Superman Adventures, and this will be the last of the Clipper Ships. That will be coming up on our next Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. But right now, let's see what's going on with the Aldrich family. We'll check them out in a moment. President Biden recently released a massive $6 trillion budget, the largest budget in U.S. history. And guess who pays the bill? That's right, you, the American taxpayer. American citizens and business owners will be paying more taxes. That's a fact. And if you owe back taxes, they will be coming after you to collect payments. In fact, President Biden also hired thousands more IRS agents to go after you. If you got a letter from the IRS and you know you owe back taxes or you haven't filed in years, don't put your head in the sand. Call us today. We've saved our customers millions of tax dollars. One quick, free phone call will show you how we can reduce your past tax bill and save you thousands. Guaranteed, or you pay nothing. Call now. 800-932-1431. 800-932-1431. That's 800-932-1431. 
Paid for by the Tax Helpline. Now on Classic Radio Theater, a very taxing episode of The Aldrich Family, starring Ezra Stone as Henry. This episode goes back 76 years, April 1st, 1948. The Aldrich Family, based on characters originated by Clifford Goldsmith and starring Ezra Stone as Henry with Jackie Kelk as Homer. Henry! Henry Aldrich! Coming, Mother! The month of April may bring its showers, but a little rain has never yet dampened the spirits of a teenage boy. And that's the reason it's fun to know a youngster like Henry Aldrich, for you can't stay down when a real American boy is bouncing around. Now the scene opens at the Aldrich breakfast table. Oh, boy, Mother, oh, boy, wouldn't you say I'm lucky, Mother? Yes, dear, but will you please eat your cereal? Sure, but, but gee, out of all the girls in this town, I'm the one she's chosen. Henry, may I have the cream, please? The cream? Father, wouldn't you say I'm sitting pretty? What's that? Look at what I just got from Loretta. It's an invitation for dinner at her house tonight. That's fine. Pass the cream. Henry, you haven't even started your cereal. Mother, I don't want to get this letter mussed up. She would take a look at the stationery she used. Yes, dear. Father, would you like to take a look at it? I would like to have you pass me the cream. She was having a... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. What's the matter? I hadn't smelled it before. <laughs> oh. Where are you going? I'm going to take a walk down here and get the cream. Father, why don't you let me pass it to you? You just sit there and keep on smelling that letter. Now, Sam, don't tell him to smell when I've asked him to eat. Hey, Henry, where are you? Homer, where did you come from? My house. Where do you think? Gee whiz, Henry, how'd you get that smudge on your face? What smudge? April Fool. <laughs> Listen, is this April Fool's Day? How did I let a thing like that happen? Why, so it is. Hi, Mr. Aldrich. Did you know you had a flat tire out in front? That's fine. Don't you believe me? Homer, come here a second. Do you want to smell something? No. Go ahead, smell it. Henry, you can't fool me with a thing like that. I know it's got pepper on it. <laughs> on this? Well, look, it's a letter from Loretta Darlington. Yeah, April Fool. You're crazy. Henry, I'm sorry, but you will have to use one hand to eat with, regardless of how wonderful that letter is. Yes, Mother. Homer, you know what surprised me more than anything? Why? Well... For three weeks now, I've been trying to get up enough courage to ask her to go to the dance Saturday night. Yesterday, I did. And what do you think she said? Why? Henry, will you please pass the toast? Yes. And then, Homer, right out of a clear sky, I get this. Henry. Henry, your father wants something. I'm going to answer the phone. For me? What is his father? Will you please pass Loretta? Uh, never mind. Just skip it. Well, here, Homer. Pass my father the sugar. I don't want the sugar. Do you want the cream, Mr. Aldrich? I've had the cream. Uh, could it be the butter, father? It could not. I've forgotten what it is. Henry, could I have that piece of toast there? Sure. Homer, give that to me. Oh, Sure, Mr. Aldrich, here. Homer, you and Henry are both wanted on the telephone. Yes, somebody wants us. Both of us? Who was it? All I know is it's the main office at the school, and Miss Shea wants to speak with one of you. Miss Shea? Uh -huh. Oh, boy, Homer. Oh, boy. Henry, hurry right back. What could it be, do you suppose? Oh, frankly, it could be one of two things. Here, Henry, you take the receiver. Uh, Homer, I can't. I've got my mouth full. You have not. You haven't got a thing in it. I have to. Hello? Hello, is this Henry Aldrich? Well... No, not exactly. This is... This is Homer Brown. Oh. Well, you'll do just as well. I will. Mr. Bradley has asked me to tell you that it won't be necessary for you and Henry Aldrich to report to any classes today. Oh. You mean we're expelled? What's that, Homer? He wants you to help decorate the auditorium for the spring play. Oh, boy, he does? He does what, Homer? He also wanted me to ask you whether you have all your homework finished. Why, yes, I've got it right here in my pocket. You have? In fact, I've got it right here in my hand now. You have? Well, you might just as well tear it up. Tear it up? Okay. What's that, Homer? Look, Henry. Look at what Miss Shea says we can do. Oh, my goodness, you didn't tear it, did you? Now, listen, Agnes, is that you? Oh, my goodness. Agnes, do you realize what you've done to us? Oh, was that Agnes? Yes, and look at my homework. Oh, boy, that's a swell April Fool joke. Homer, look at what I've done. What's the matter? When you began tearing, I began tearing, too. Look at Loretta's invitation at dinner tonight. Gee whiz, you can still go, can't you? Sure, naturally, but... Homer, 
Well, we've got to get even with her. That's what I say. I'm going to call her up and tell her I'm Mr. Bradley. Homer, oh, that won't be any good. I've got a better idea. I can see the whole thing just as clear as day. Well, what is it? What is it? You know all those contests Agnes is always entering? Yeah. She was when we get to school, we'll tell one of the fellas to tell her she won a hundred dollars. Sure, Henry, sure. Only let's make it five hundred. Sure, and really spread it around. Sure. We'll tell everybody. Boy, we'll tell everybody in this school. <laughs> Have you heard? Have you heard about Agnes Love? Really? You mean to say she won all that money? Sure. Let's go ask her about it. Hi, you heard about Agnes? Yeah, and can you beat it? I sit next to her in English. Hey, what's this I hear about Agnes? Did she really win a contest? Sure, she sure she did. Look at her over in that crowd. Let's go tell her. Agnes Lawson won all that money? You're crazy. I am not. I know somebody that says she knows somebody that heard it on the radio last night. Did you hear it? No, but it's all over the school, though. Hi, Homer. There she is over there. Agnes. Oh, Agnes. What do you want? Oh, we want to tell you something. Agnes, did you know you won $1,000 in a contest? You're crazy. You did, too, ask anybody in school, Agnes. You're crazy. I won 2500 You did? You did? Sure, I did. Imagine. Homer, what do you know about that? I can hardly believe it. Well, I did, Homer Brown, and don't try to make out it couldn't be possible. I know, Agnes, but $2,500? That much never occurred to me. Well, I did. And if you don't believe me, you can ask anybody here on the campus. Oh, Agnes, we're not trying to make you out a liar, only what contest was it? How should I know? I enter one every time I pick up a new magazine. Hello, Agnes. I came over to tell you how proud I am to know you. Thanks. Yes, Agnes, you're really smart. You know what I think I'll do, fellas? I think I'll take the whole gang over to the soda fountain and treat them after school. You will? Oh, really, Will? Sure. Homer, could you let me borrow a dollar until I get my prize? What's that? I'll tell you, Agnes, I've got to go or I'll be late to class. Yes, same here. Goodbye, Agnes. Agnes, are you sure the whole thing isn't an April Fool joke? Listen, don't you think I know one of those when I see one? Didn't I tell you what I did to Henry? No. I wrote him a note and asked him to come to Loretta Darlington's for dinner tonight. Really? Sure, I even signed Loretta's name to it. Boy, do I love April Fool jokes. <laughs> Have some more potatoes, Sam? No, thank you, Alice. Henry, can I give you anything? Mm, no, thank you. I'll just sit here and watch you eat. I'm sorry, dear, that we're having such a good dinner on the evening you're invited over to Loretta's. Oh, that's all right, Mother. We'll probably have a swell dinner over there, too. Boy, did, I, did Homer and I play the darndest April Fool joke today. Alice, may I have the biscuits, please? Here you are. It's the best April Fool joke I ever thought of. Henry, are, are you quite sure you shouldn't be starting for Loretta's? Mother, I've got loads of time. Look, here's part of her invitation right here. She says, we won't be eating tonight until 8.30. Be sure to come good and hungry. Well, Henry, will you please answer that? Stay where you are, Henry. I'll answer it. I'm expecting a call. Mother, what are you and Father having for dessert? Hello, this is Sam Aldridge speaking. Uh, Mr. Aldridge, this is Mr. Lawson. Who? Agnes Lawson's father. Oh, yes, yes, hello. Say, uh, Sam, I don't know whether you heard about it or not, but the Lawson family seems to have struck oil. What's that? You mean you haven't heard about it? No, not a word. Well, uh, don't you listen to the radio? No, not if I can help it. Well, Sam, I don't know why we weren't listening last night ourselves, but we understand Agnes won the grand prize. You don't say so. Now, Sam, I want to ask your advice about something. Agnes says she's been reading the rules, and she's under the impression that the winner must appear in New York for the check. Yes, that sounds reasonable. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking. Only Agnes can't possibly make a trip to New York by herself, and Mrs. Lawson and I can't get away. And what I was wondering was, uh, could you go up and represent us with a power of attorney? Why, when would I have to leave? Tomorrow. We've sent a telegram for instructions, and I imagine they'll say they want us to come right on to New York. Tomorrow, the only thing is... We'd be glad to pay your expenses, Sam, and make it right with you in the bargain. Why, you pay my expenses, and that's all I ask for. Any young lady that's smart enough to go out and win a contest deserves everything she can get out of it. Mean you'll go? I think I could arrange things. As a matter of fact, I'd like a trip to New York. That's fine, fine. Now I won't have to worry. No, don't you worry about a thing. Uh, just one more thing before you hang up. If you don't mind uh, keeping this confidential, because we heard it was 2500 and Agnes feels it's 35 and then we've heard from another source that it might be even more. Oh, you don't say so. And naturally, until we know just how we really do stand, we don't want to go around talking too much. I see your point. Goodbye. Dear, your dinner's getting cold. Come here, Alice. I've got something to tell her you won't believe. Sam, what's the matter? 
Mr. Mr. Lawson just phoned me. Yes? And it looks as though I'll have to leave for New York tomorrow. On this short notice, Sam? I can arrange it, I think. Mother, don't you want me to tell you what I was going to? No, Henry, not now. But, Mother, it was the best April Fool joke you ever heard of. Henry, will you please go back into the dining room while I finish telling your mother something? But, Father, I'm not eating any dinner. All right, go in there and look at mine. At any rate, get out of here. Yes, Father, I'll go. Only I thought you'd like to know about that joke Homer and I played. As though an April Fool joke were important at a time like this. Alice, you won't believe it, but here's what happened. Well, sir, I may have seen bigger steaks and juicier steaks, but I don't remember where. And we can all thank Agnes for having it. Thank you, Mother. Did you really use up all our ration coupons to get this dinner? Yes, dear. Ed, you aren't cutting those slices a little bit thick, are you? Gertrude, are you forgetting what has happened to the Lawson family? Why don't we have any bigger plates than these? Oh, Ed, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going downtown tomorrow and buy a whole new dinner set. Now, Gertrude, we don't need to spend any money on dishes. Besides, I've got that money all planned out for Agnes. You have, Father? First thing I'm going to do is see whether I can get a priority to get a new car. For me? Agnes, you aren't old enough to drive a car. You know you aren't. Here, pass this steak to your mother. Ed, I don't care for any. I can't eat a thing. Well, what's the matter with you? Not a thing. Only if I can't get a new dinner set out of this, why... All I... right, go ahead and get a dinner set. And, Father, you know what I want to get? First of all, a new evening dress. A new what? Without any shoulders. Boy. <laughs> Agnes, do you realize that I haven't finished telling your father what I'm going to do? Well, folks, I've got that all attended to. Ralph, you're interrupting your mother. Oh, excuse me, but I, I just wanted to tell you I resigned my job. You resigned, Ralph? Sure, I gave up my job Saturday night at the Havens Drug Store. On my money? Well, you're my sister, aren't you? I'm going to have somebody to go to the dance Saturday night. How are you going to pay for the tickets? Listen, Agnes, don't be so selfish. Henry! Yes, Father? I thought you were coming down here so I could have a talk with you. Just one more minute, Father. What's the matter with the boy? Sam, he's upstairs changing his tie. Again? That's the third time he's changed it this evening. Dear, he's going over to Loretta Darlington's in just a few minutes. Yes. Father, is, is there something you wanted? There is. Henry, your father's just been talking with me, and he has a grand idea. He has? Yes, dear, and I'm going to let him tell you about it. Yes, Father. Henry, it's been a long time since you and I have done anything together, hasn't it? Well, we had a milkshake together last week. <laughs> yes, but... Henry, how would you like to make a trip to New York with me? To New York, Father? Yes, sir, you and I get on the train tomorrow, and we'll go on a real binge for the weekend. To New York? To New York. But... But how about my school tomorrow afternoon? I can get you out of it, I think. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And you're asking me whether I want to go? I thought you'd like it. Only, how about Loretta? I, I asked her to go to the dance Saturday night. Well, I don't think she'd want to stand in the way of your going to New York, would she? No, she was. After all, she's having me for dinner tonight, so that won't make it as though I weren't going to see her at all. Henry! Yes, Mother? Homer's on the phone. He is? Father, will you excuse me while I speak to him, please? And, and thank you very much for telling me. Hello? Hey, Henry, wait did you hear what happened to me? To you, Homer, when do you hear about me? Well, Henry, I got a job at the Havens Drugstore for Saturday night. You did? Sure, the guy that was working there just quit on a moment's notice. But, Homer, when do you hear what happened to me? What? Wait till I tell you. My father and I are going to New York. You are? Yeah, we're going on a blowout. Do you know how high the Empire State Building is? Sure, 75 stories. You're crazy, Homer. Seventy-five stories. It's around two hundred and fifty, and I'm going all the way to the top. Sure, Henry. I know a couple of guys that have been to the top. But, but Homer, did you ever eat in an automatic restaurant? All you do is put in a nickel, and boy, things come right out at you. Henry, your father wants to speak to you. He does, Mother. Homer, goodbye, and I'll send you a postcard. Okay, and I'll be back here drinking all the sodas I can hold. So long. Henry. Yes, Father. Henry, I've got to make the Pullman reservations right away. Are you quite sure it'll be all right for you to break your date with this Loretta of what's-her-name? Sure, Father. She won't mind staying, staying home. She's a very good sport. You're quite sure. Sure. Hello? Number, please. Um, L991. L991? Yes, please. Gee, Father, did Homer turn green when I told him about New York City? Yes. Boy, poor kid back here in Center Rail where Hello? There's... Hello? Hello? Hello. Didn't you recognize my voice? This is Henry. Oh, Henry Aldrich? Yes. I I'm sorry to bother you right this minute, Loretta, but my father just asked me to go up in the Empire State Building with him. What's that? We're going to New York. Well, you are, Henry. Yes, tomorrow. And, and I was just wondering whether it would be all right if I couldn't take you to the dance Saturday night. Well, Henry, as a matter of fact, it works out fine because somebody just phoned me a few minutes ago and asked me to go with him. Oh, somebody did? Yes. A friend of mine who's just come into a lot of money. Oh. I hope you have an 
nice time in New York, Henry. Well, thanks, Loretta, and, and I'll be over in just a couple of minutes. What's that? Boy, and am I starved. Goodbye. <laughs> Agnes Lawson has sent an April Fool letter to Henry, inviting him to dinner tonight at Loretta Darlington's. Henry and Homer, in order to keep April Fool's Day from being a total loss, have led Agnes to believe that she's the winner of a radio contest. The scene opens in Loretta Darlington's home. The time is around 9.15. Well, well, Mrs. Darlington... Yes, Henry? Nothing. I'm sorry Loretta isn't here right this minute, Henry. She said she was going to step out, and she told me where she was going. But I didn't pay any attention. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Darlington. That's all right. I'd just as soon sit here. Uh, if you have any work to do in the kitchen, you go right ahead with it. You're not keeping me from one thing, Henry. I'm not. Won't you have another piece of candy? Oh, I don't mind if I do. Just a moment while I take this next layer of paper out. I didn't realize we'd eaten practically half a box. It's very good candy. Is it your favorite kind? Oh, I like any kind, and... And you don't have to worry. It never spoils my appetite. Good. Tell me, did you have any April Fool jokes played on you today? No, I got by this year with what you might call a clean slate. <laughs> my goodness. Did I tell you what Agnes did to Loretta? No, ma'am. Mrs. Darlington, when Loretta went out, did she say about how long she'd be gone? No, I don't think she did. Well, where's Mr. Darlington? I haven't seen him since I got here. He went to a lodge meeting. Oh, he did? Is he... Having dinner there? Oh, my, no. He grabbed a bite before he left. Oh. <laughs> Too bad he couldn't wait. Well, as I started to tell you, Henry, Agnes Lawson has played more jokes today. Do you know what she did this morning? What? She didn't say one word to Loretta about it, but she wrote a note to Loretta's father and asked him whether she could have a dollar and signed Loretta's name. And Mr. Darlington never knew the difference and gave Loretta a dollar. He did? Yes. And Agnes not only made her handwriting look exactly like Loretta's, but where she ever got Loretta's scented stationery, I never will know. Oh. Oh! Agnes did that? Yes. Wasn't that a good one? Oh. Mrs. Darlington, would you tell me something frankly? Yes. About how many meals have you had here so far today? Why, three. Why do you ask? Oh. Oh! Well, well so Agnes did a thing like that to Loretta. Mother! Loretta, come in here. Mother, who's kind of out there in the hall? Oh, hello, Henry. Oh. My goodness, I've been over to the Lawsons and more things have happened to them. What, for instance? They're so rich, Mother, they're practically rolling in money. Mrs. Lawson put in a long-distance call all the way to San Francisco just to tell old Mrs. Lawson about it. About what? The $3,500 they won. Haven't you heard, Henry? Loretta Agnes didn't win any money. Why, Henry, she did, too. She was. she couldn't have. The whole thing was an April Fool joke. Why, Henry, it couldn't have been. But I'm telling you, Homer and I... We made the whole thing up. If you ask me, Henry Aldrich, I don't like your attitude. All right, all right, I'll show you. As a matter of fact, Henry, if you're going to contradict me like that, I'm glad I'm not going to the dance with you. And as a matter of fact, I'm glad I'm going to San Francisco. I mean, New York. Goodbye. Henry Aldrich, I think you're insane. Just what do you mean by a statement like that? Well, Mr. Lawson told me himself that your own father is going to New York to collect the money for Agnes. My father? Yes, your father. That's why he's going? Yes. And I... Now listen, Loretta. Gee whiz! But Agnes, you didn't. You couldn't possibly have. Henry, I suppose you think I don't know an April Fool's joke when I see one. But I'm not kidding you. You didn't win it. Wait a second, Henry. Let me explain it to her. Agnes, Henry, and I just made the whole thing up. By Homer Brown. And I suppose you made up the fact that I entered that contest. You may have entered it, but you didn't win it. Now, Henry, for the last time, I'm not going to be April Fool's. You're just trying to get back at me for writing that letter to you from Loretta. What letter, Henry? Never mind, Homer. Let's just take one thing at a time. <laughs> now, listen, Agnes. I'm not going to listen to one thing you say. Of all the jealous people. But, Agnes! Wait. What's all this noise in here? Oh, she was, hello, Mr. Lawson. That's the trouble. Mr. Lawson, there, there's something we feel we ought to tell you. Well? Agnes thinks she won a lot of money, see? Yes? And she won't believe she didn't. Well, why shouldn't she believe it? But, but Mr. 
Mr. Watson, I guess you didn't understand. This is April Fool's Day, see? I know, but I don't think you boys ought to try to pull a joke like this one. What's that? Pretty serious thing, boys, when you deliberately tell somebody they didn't win a prize like $3,500 when it's common knowledge that they did. But she couldn't have, and, and she might fall. I won't tell your father about this, Henry, but you better be running along. Agnes has had a pretty big day, and for that matter, this whole family has. We're in no mood for jokes. You mean you don't believe us either? You boys just forget it's April Fool's Day and go home and get your schoolwork done. But Mr. Lawson... Now run along. Good night. Gee, was that a fine thing? Henry... Did we make this whole thing up? Or did Agnes really win that prize? Listen, Homer, we've got to do something about this. Hello? Mr. Lawson speaking. Hello, this is the telegraph office. Yes? I got a telegram here for you. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Is it from New York? Well, it has New York written at the top. There's something about it I want to explain to you, but I think I'd better read it to you first. All right. It says, This is to inform you that Agnes Lawson did not win $3,500 because she couldn't have. You are the victim of an April Fool joke. Oh. Oh, uh, they say anything else? No, that's all. Oh. But I think I ought to tell you, Mr. Lawson, that that telegram didn't really come over the wires. Henry Aldrich and Homer Brown dropped in here a few minutes ago and told me to phone it to you. Oh, you don't say so. Henry Aldrich and Homer Brown, eh? Henry, do you realize what a serious thing this is that you and Homer have done? Sending a telegram that wasn't even real. But, Father, we... Don't you boys like Agnes? I always suppose she was a pretty nice girl. She is, Mr. Aldrich, but she hasn't any sense of humor. That's the point. You think a thing like this is funny? No, Father, not anymore we don't. Do you think any family in their right mind would go ahead and make all the plans they have if they hadn't won the money? I have a good mind not to take you to New York. But, Father, that's the point. Don't you understand? Henry, for the last time, let's not fool about this anymore. I've changed our plans and we're going tonight. My bag is right here and it's all packed. But, Father... If you want to go with me, you have ten minutes in which to pack your things. You mean you're going now? I ought to be on the way to the station right this minute. But, Father, you can take that train. Even if you cut off my allowance for the next six months, you've got to listen to me. <laughs> Will you have another hamburger, Homer? Thanks. I don't mind if I do. Boy, am I hungry. Could I have the catsup, please? Here. These hamburgers are the best I ever ate in my life, Henry. I'm glad you like them, Agnes. Um, would you like to have me put another nickel in the jukebox? Yes, that'd be swell. Agnes, is your brother Ralph going back to work in the Haven's Drugstore this Saturday night, or is he going to wait a week? No, he's going right back. Boy, is he mad at me. Why is he mad at you? I don't know. Nobody in my family is speaking to me. That's the way it is in my family. Well, as a matter of fact. And you know, maybe it's just as well I didn't get it. Didn't get what? My evening dress without shoulders. I guess I'm just not the type. Boy, has this been a day. I'll say it has. Same here. Henry, you spilled some ketchup on your tie. But you was where? April Fool. Now listen, Agnes. It's 12 o'clock, Henry, and you can't get back at me. Listen again next week, same time, same station, for another sparkling half hour with your favorite youngster, his family, and his pals. The Aldrich Family, starring Ezra Stone, is written by Clifford Goldsmith. From 82 years ago, April 1st, 1942, the Aldrich family. And and, uh, I I have to tell you, the interesting part about this program, uh, you heard all the comments about them uh, having to do without their ration points and such. Uh, that That was a thing back then. 
All righty, uh, Classic Radio Theater continues in just a moment after I remind you to come visit my webpage, classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows, learn about building classic radio collections of your own. You can contact me there. You can buy me a copy if you'd like to support the show. Our social media links are there as well. We'll go back 85 years to pre-World War II, April 1st, 1939, and an episode of the Avalon Time program with Red Skelton. Should an enemy attack the United States, radioactive fallout would be a major threat, whether you live in a big town or small one. So know how to protect yourself against it, like this family. Come on, honey, to the shelter. Will we be safe against radioactive fallout? Sure, I followed civil defense plans, put three feet of earth over it. Hey, come on, Dad and Mom. I've got the Conrad station tuned in on the battery radio. Sis is checking the food and water supply. Might have to last us two weeks, son. It will. Janie and I saw to that. Wise family and a safe one. An underground shelter is your best defense against fallout. A basement refuge is good, too. Make one by placing sandbags, magazines, bedding, any dense material around and over a shelter area in your basement. The basement itself provides some protection. An ordinary house would probably cut the radiation in half if you stay on the first floor near the center of the house. So be prepared. Know how to protect yourself against radioactive fallout. We don't have a lot of Red Skelton in old-time radio, even though he did do a lot. This episode of Babylon Time uh, all goes all the way back 85 years, April 1st, 1939, as Red deals with April Fool's Day. A pack of Avalon cigarettes, please. Yes, sir. Oh, just a moment, sir. Don't forget your change. You'd never guess, but Avalon's cost you less. Good evening. This is Del King saying welcome to Avalon Time with Red Foley, Jeanette, Edna Stilwell, the Avalon Chorus, Bob Strong and his orchestra, and Red Shelton. The orchestra opens the program with Don't Look Now. <laughs> gentlemen, Avalons are the newest and most important recent development in cigarette history. They're quality cigarettes that sell for less, three to five cents less than other popular price brands. And three to five cents saved on every pack of cigarettes you smoke really means something. Take it from me. It means many, many extra dollars in your pocket every year. But without knowing it, you'd never guess that Avalons cost you less. The quality of the Turkish and domestic tobaccos blended in union-made Avalons cannot be surpassed by any other cigarette, regardless of price, regardless of brand. For cigarette value never known before, try Avalon. Why not make it tonight? bring you the only man in radio who hangs around the Navy Pier so he can get jokes by the gobs, <laughs> Red Skelton. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Say, Dell, speaking of sailors, I took my first cruise last week on the SS Panhandler. <laughs> Just a tramp steamer. <clears throat> but... But the boat was nice, though. It was very particular who rode on it. In fact, it was so particular, they wouldn't take anything but registered cattle. <laughs> mm. 
Deep, <laughs> but it's really a nice boat. Everything aboard was ship shape. <laughs> In fact, the girls aboard were ship shape. <laughs> My uncle, what happened? <laughs> My uncle used to be a well-known sea captain. In fact, even the finance company calls him the old skipper. <laughs> you know, it's the first time I ever rode on a boat, but it was like being on a train. I rode the rail all the way. <laughs> the captain, <laughs> the captain looked at me and he says, uh, my good man, you have a weak stomach. <laughs> at a time like that, he wanted distance. <laughs> Boy, what a captain, took it. <laughs> the captain wanted me to eat at his table, but I refused. Why should I pay for a first-class ticket and then eat with a help? <laughs> the, oh, what a screwy captain, though. He yelled, oh, hands on deck. I put my hands on deck and everybody stepped on them. <laughs> Our first stop was a little island where a lot of native boys were diving in the water for pennies. Of course, I didn't get much out of that. <laughs> Maybe five or six cents. I <laughs> But you meet a lot of strange people aboard. They were aboard. There was one lady, a fat lady, with a home body, <laughs> built like a house. <laughs> she spent the whole night walking around the deck trying to reduce. Well, I guess you read someplace about those hits that passed in the night. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm really lucky to be here. There was a terrible storm blew up the third day, and everybody thought the boat was going to sink, and the captain started yelling. Save the women and children first. Well, you know, it was disgusting the way some of the men try to get in those lifeboats. No kidding. One guy nearly tore my dress off of me. <laughs> well, I think I've been out here sailing around long enough, so I'll pull into shore. Sure. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> See, I even read the blotches on the paper. That's mine. <laughs> I'll let the speedboat strong take over with Begin the Begin. Hit it, sailor, but salty. Orchestra playing Begin the Begin. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Strong is the only conductor that doesn't lead the band with a baton. He just waves his hair. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll say, Skelton, I know that you have on a new suit tonight. Yeah, I was down in the dumps today, and I always buy a new suit when I sit down in the dumps. I was wondering why you bought your suit, Skelton. <laughs> What'd you say, Del? That was Roger, the fiddle player in the band. Oh, little Slurreco, eh? <laughs> Why, that guy's not even a fiddle player. I'll bet I'm more at home with a violin than he is. Not on the radio, Skelton. No. On the radio, you'd be more at home with Bose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Major. And you better not get caught in the rain with that suit. Look, I ain't worried about the rain. This is a good suit. Maybe you think so, but confidentially, it shrinks. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Hmm. Is that the telephone bell? It ain't Jimmy Fiddler. <laughs> I'll take that. Hello. 
Avalon cigarette program, Red Skelton, Skelton speaking. <laughs> Can't even say my own name. Avalon uh, Skelton. Yes. This is Sergeant Browning at our police headquarters. Huh? We've been hearing a lot about you, Skelton. Yeah, well, you can't prove anything. <laughs> now, look, I won't talk until I get a mouthful. A mouthpiece. <laughs> what we want to get you for is the policeman's ball. I didn't take the policeman's ball. Honest, I didn't. <laughs> There's the wise person. We want you to come over and entertain at the policeman's annual ball. Oh, the ball, all oh, the policeman's ball. Oh, sure. Listen, I'll bring the whole gang over. Can you send a couple of squad cars over to pick us up? No, but uh, I think the chief might send over the paddy wagon. The, the paddy wagon? You want me to come over and entertain at the policeman's ball? He's going to send a patrol wagon for me to ride in? Red Skelton riding a wagon that they haul criminals around in? Tell him okay. <laughs> Tell him to send wagon number two. The springs are better. <laughs> That's our will, that's our will. And Fred Skelton, do you know where Fred Allen lives? I guess I know where Fred Allen lives. Why? Well, if you can get him, you don't have to bother coming over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll be there. Don't worry. Hey, gang, come on. Hey, Bob Strong, get the boys together. We're going over to the policeman's ball. Okay, Skelton. What music shall I take? Rhapsody in Blue Coat? <laughs> no, and don't take Flatfoot Fluji either. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Skelton. Hello, Edna. Say, boy, me going to a policeman's ball. You know, I'm getting to be a big shot. How would you like to be as important as I am? Why, are you important, Edna? I'll say. You know, next week the president and his wife are going to visit the San Francisco World Fair. Well, how does that make you important, Edna? Why, Mrs. Roosevelt's going to write and tell me all about it. My word. No, my day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some connection. Say, where's Red Foley? He's over there rehearsing his lines for that Western picture he's going to make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's sneak over and listen to what he's saying. Why, killing's too good for you, Pies and Pete. Why, you on the critter have a good Hey, notion. Foley. Quiet, tender foot. I'll grill you like it was an oil well. <laughs> you wouldn't dare. <laughs> hey, listen, tender. <laughs> Oh, I said that. <laughs> I forgot myself. <laughs> hey, what do you want? Well, look, we're going over the policeman's ball. Now, you're not such a bad hombre that you're afraid of the cops, are you? Oh, don't worry about me, Skelton. Nobody's been able to pin anything on me since I was a baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, not bad, Jack. Uh, come in. Uh, Mr. Benny. Uh, Benny? No, I'm Red Skelton. Say, how many miles is it to Waukegan? <laughs> Oh, there's a guy that's really been knocking around the country. <laughs> I hope he don't get in the Yankee Stadium and start rapping on Joe Lewis. <laughs> By the way, Red, I got your tickets for the Lewis Galento fight. Oh, they good? Yeah, the best I could do, though, was the two seats in the fourth row. Well, that's well. Two seats in the fourth row at the Yankee Stadium. These seats are in the fourth row of a Fifth Avenue bus. Yeah. <laughs> Fifth Avenue bus? I can't see the Lewis and Galento fight from there. Well, it'll be the same thing. Yeah, They're going to drive up in front of the Yankee Stadium, ring a bell, and knock over a beer barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you know, if I have to think I'm going to the fight, I better cancel my uh, lesson in public speaking today. Are you taking lessons in public speaking? Yeah, I've been muffing too many words lately, so I'm uh, taking a course in public speaking. And you know, when I get finished, you know what I'll be? Sure. <laughs> public loudmouth number one. <laughs> Now, listen, wise guy, I'll be a great orator. Say, you don't even know what an orator is, Skelton. Oh, I do, too. An orator is a guy who's willing to lay down your life for somebody else's country. <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, come on, let's all have a kid going over the policeman's vault. What are you going to sing, Jeanette? Just a minute, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> say, who are you? I'm Professor Tommy Mack, your voice instructor. <laughs> My voice instructor? Do you always talk that way? No, only when I speak. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for your lesson? Yeah, I need somebody to teach me how to read a script. I'll tell you, Joe, last week it was talking to me to something, the way you twipped over your twist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I need is a few more months, I'll be in the fur business. <laughs> now, the question you must concentrate on is enunciation, pronunciation, and fiction. <laughs> Boy, what that guy... <laughs> What that guy couldn't do with the any penny fishes. <laughs> oh, a white guy, huh? Don't pay any attention to him. That's Roger, the fiddle player. Now, I just want to see how you control your breath. Yeah. Now, let's see your pant like this. Okay. <laughs> How's that? No 
good your pants are too short. <laughs> Look, most of my trouble comes from not knowing where to place my tongue. Well, the tongue should be plain, but it should be placed between two fingers of bread. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean the tongue in your mouth, if I be on so so. <laughs> now open up your mouth, please. Uh, well, the teeth are okay. Yeah. The teeth? What are teeth? Teeth is poor for tooth. Many tooth make teeth. Teeth is not for tooth. Without teeth, you can't eat. Any dope knows what teeth is. <laughs> you ought to know, Professor. What's the matter with that guy? He's doing it something? He's got enough money to my... Don't pay no attention, sir. <laughs> Listen, Professor, you better hurry and give him my first lesson. I've got to get over the policeman's ball. Okay, now the first thing you do is you clink in the muscles of exposed by pinning on the ball. Uh, will the bartender object? Why, <laughs> oh, you're stupid too, huh? <laughs> well, I think we better learn how to recite. Recite? Yes, oh. so follow me. I did do do the cat and the fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> well, people to make it so hard <laughs> I did a fiddle, the cat and the fiddle, and the cow and jumped out all along there or mixed up myself. <laughs> I did a fiddle, the cat and the fiddle, and the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed. The little dog laughed. You see, that's fun. Say, where did you get that goon? <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Now, don't get excited, Professor. Hey, wait a minute, Professor. You better come back and finish my list. Say, he's got a heavenly voice, hasn't he? <laughs> That's the first time I ever knew, though, that heaven could speak. <laughs> Sing it, Jeanette. We gotta go to the ball. you go, you'll find tobacco dealers selling more and more Avalon cigarettes. And you want to know the reason? Well, I'll tell you. Because Avalons have that national appeal of highest quality plus real money-saving economy. Two all-important points of superiority that smart buyers immediately recognize and take advantage of. Avalons are positively second to none in quality. They're union-made from the very finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos. And still, they cost three to five cents less per pack than other popular price brands. Now imagine, three to five cents less for cigarettes that can't be topped. Ladies and gentlemen, cash in on this. The biggest cigarette money-saving opportunity of the day. So the next time, ask for Avalon. You'd never guess they cost you less. (laughs) 
We now take you to the policeman's ball where we find Red Skelton dancing with Edna Stilwell on the crowded dance floor. Oh, I'm sorry, Edna. Oh, that's all feet. right. You know, Red, I dreamt I was dancing with you last night. You did? Yeah. When I woke up, my little brother was pounding my feet with a flat iron. <laughs> Say, let's try some of that jitterbug stuff. Come on, let's jive, baby. Let's get on the old proof Hot dog, get the stuff. Uh-oh, there's a cop. Don't give you the right name. Come, Come on. Hold on, Red. Hold on, Red. There you go. Uh, what's the matter, officer? Can't you see that sign there? No heavy trucking on the outer driveway. <laughs> no heavy trucking on the outer driveway. That's what is known as corn off of the cop. <laughs> well, okay, officer, we won't let it happen again. You can look at the policeman, Edna. Most cops I've seen since the last nursemaid picnic. <laughs> Say, look at the dirty look those bulls are giving me. Ah, don't you guys look at somebody else for a change. Well, look who's here. Are you a policeman? Well, I ain't rent you on the mountain. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Please, <laughs> Yes, Mr. Skelman, I'm just dying to get my hooks on some crook. Yeah. Why, I've got a gun and handcuffs. Yeah. Why, just take a look at these snarky-looking bracelets. <laughs> See, there's some bracelets, all right. Don't you think they look more business-like, though, if they didn't have those rhinestones in them? <laughs> What kind of a policeman are you, Herky? Well, you see, it's like this, Miss Stilwell. When I first joined the force, I went to the mounted police headquarters and said, Give me a man a horse he can ride. <laughs> yeah? I wasn't the man. <laughs> so they made me a patrol. Yeah. Then I complained about patrolling the streets because it made my feet spread. Ooh. Now I sit in a radio car all day and I'm day is just something <laughs> Done any dancing yet, Herky? Oh, shut, Mr. Skelton. I can't dance. You can't? Because when I dance, I exert myself. And when I exert myself, I glow. <laughs> oh. Well, when you got to glow, you got to glow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can always get out of your wet clothes and do a dry martini. <laughs> oh, Mr. Skelton, my goodness. I hope you don't ever use anything like that on your program. I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Well, I gotta go now. You see, I'm just a rookie, and tonight they're making me scrub the jail floors. Yeah. So I gotta go and wash out a few sing things. I'll see you later. <laughs> oh, good old Herky. Say, it's about time for the show to start, Edna. Maybe I better get up on the stage and start throwing those bulls a little corn. Hey, mm. Red, Red, yes, Red, you're yes. on. Yeah. Look, tell them to give me a fanfare, Bell. Gee, I hate to go on. I'm telling you, the same thing happens that happened last year. I'm in the vegetable business again. <laughs> well, don't forget, this is another year. Yeah, but don't forget, these are the same jokes. <laughs> well, there's the trumpet of doom. Well, here goes nothing. Say, Edna, what's Red so nervous about? Oh, he thinks the cops don't like him. No, uh, uh, they really love him. <laughs> well, no vegetables yet. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> hey, Red. Red, yeah. try that pure fire joke about the cops. Oh, okay, I'll give it. Say, fellas, did you ever hear the one about the policeman who raided the nudist colony? And the big headlines in the paper the following day read, Bulls raid bears. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, there's somebody else entertain you. Put a loud mouth out there. No use, Edna. Those cops will never like me. Say, you know what? I just happened to think of something. I've been entertaining here at the policeman's ball for the past three years, and every time the same thing has happened. And I just now realize why they'll never like Red Shelton. Why not? Why not? You know how mad bulls get when they see Red. <laughs> a new distinctive interpretation of a familiar favorite. Red Foley and the Avalon Chorus sing Roll Along Prairie Moon. Maybe you're lonely too. 
singing by in the sky, prairie moon. Oh, prairie moon. I need your tender light to make things right. You know I'm so alone tonight. I'm the girl of my dreams. Tell her to I've been through prairie moon. There's a wonderful light in the sky tonight. With silver, the hills are spread. That I know it will hear every word of my love serenade. Far away, shed your beam on the girl of my dreams. Tell her to I've been. Thanks a lot, Bob Strong, for letting us in on those famous three little words. And what I have to say are just a few words that mean money in your pocket. Friends, when you can get supreme quality in Avalon's for less, why pay more? So the next time, ask for Avalon. And don't forget your change. Yes, Avalon cigarettes, dear friends, cross several cents less than others. You too can save the difference like all of us Avalon brothers. Each package wrapped in fellow made, each package you can save. No wonder folks from coast to coast say Avalon sing to parade. So why not always travel on with Avalon? Yes, you'd never guess, but Avalon costs only 10 cents plus city or state tax. Well, I guess that's, that's about takes care of everything for tonight, eh, Dell? Yes, Red, that polishes it off. Say, Dell, when I get through with my course in pub, uh, public speaking, <laughs> maybe I can tell my jokes in a cultivated voice, huh? Sure, Skelton. Then you can give us cultivated corn. Yeah. Oh, you can't win. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. See you next week. <laughs> Be with us 
us next Saturday evening at the same time when the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation will again present Avalon Time as our special guest star, a character you all know and love, the old-timer, featured artist on Fibber McGee and Molly's program. Del King speaking. Good night. <laughs> Never knew heaven to speak performed on this program is from Rose of Washington Square. This is the National Broadcasting Company. There you have it, Red Skelton, and that a lot of our shows uh, are of worse quality than you just heard. I will tell you that of the Red Skelton show. We're working on finding some more. 85 years ago, April 1st, 1939. Not bad for that long ago, if you really think about it. Uh, We'll wrap up this April Fool's edition of Classic Radio Theater in just a moment uh, after I remind you that uh, on our uh, next program, on our Tuesday show, we will have Nick Carter, Master Detective, Let George Do It, Sherlock Holmes, Gangbusters, and an episode of Superman. But right now, let us uh, take a quick break and then we'll bring you the soap opera Claudia. Joe. Joe. Yes, dear. Joe, I smell something burning. Well, have you checked that roast you have in the oven lately? Joe, I'm serious. Joe, there's smoke pouring out of the kitchen. Hey, you're right. The wastebasket's on fire. What are you doing? Putting a cover over the wastebasket, smothering the fire. That's right, Joe. To make a fire, three things are necessary. Fuel to burn, heat to make it burn, and air to keep it burning. Take any one of these three away, and there can be no fire. In Joe's case, he took the air away so the fire couldn't burn. He could have cooled the fire by dousing it with water, no heat. Or he could have removed the fire itself, got it outside where it couldn't spread by using a shovel, broom, rake, or other tool. Be prepared. Know how to fight fires in your home. For your own protection, your local civil defense director urges you to learn now. All right, we'll wrap up this April Fool's edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox with an episode of the soap opera Claudia. And I will tell you that uh, this one is going to be dealing with April Fool's. April 1st, 1948, 76 years ago. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Claudia. Yes, Mama, what is it? How do you expect me to measure this skirt with you jiggling all over the living room? Oh, sorry. And please hand me a few more pins from the top of the table. With pleasure. Pins, pins, pins. Nice shiny pins for the lady in the green hat. How is that? That's fine. Now, if I can just get the back of your hem, even with the front... Mama. No, what? I don't see why you have to put the pins in your mouth. Because that's the only way to do this in a hurry. If you got here when you said you were going to, you wouldn't be in such a hurry now. Where were you all day? You were supposed to be here at 3 o'clock and you didn't get here till 5. Didn't I? Mama, you don't think you can keep a secret from me, do you? Certainly I can. All I have to do is put the pins back in my mouth and my lips will be permanently sealed. (laughs) You went shopping for a present for me. Mm, Present for you? Yep. I must say I have better ways of spending my time. But even if you come up with the right answer, I'm not supposed to tell you. There is something then, a surprise, a surprise. I'm surprised you're so suspicious. Can't I be a few hours late without being subjected to a cross-examination like any old bank robber? I'm going to figure this out very systematically. Now, let's see. It's the first of the month. What always happens on the first of the month? If you only stand still for two minutes, I can have this the hem The beginning pinned. of a new month. Who do you see once a month? Mama, it's Aunt Louisa. What about Aunt Louisa? Where did she come from? Why, she came right in from Long Island on the 1st of April to have lunch with you. Stand still now. Of course. And she shopped in town to get me a present for when the baby's born. Well, if it isn't Detective Lieutenant Norton, then when did you join the force? I've been a member of the force, man and boy, for these 30 years. Oh, no. Aunt Louisa isn't going to give that poor baby one of those soup terrines. You ungrateful child. 
Isn't it too bad that silver stores won't take things back when they put your monogram oh, on them? Oh, no, they haven't put our monogram on. Mama, we won't even have room for a terrine in the house at Eastbrook. We haven't got a closet big enough. Can't you put it outside the door with potted plant? Potted plant? Mommy, you're fooling. Oh, dear. Aunt Louise is so generous, and it is sweet of her to give us a present at all, and they're so expensive. Perhaps she hasn't definitely given the order. Maybe if I call her and just sort of hinted that we never eat soup, she wouldn't have the monograms put on. Mama, do I dare? Her phone number is Rockland Center 867. And if you let on I said anything to you, I'll deny categorically that I ever had a daughter and that her name was Claudia. I'll be very careful. I won't even say you're here. Hello, operator. Please give me Rockland Center 867. This is Plaza 55597. You watch and see how carefully I do this. You're wasting your time just being a prospective mother. You should be at least our ambassador to Moscow. Oh, it's too cold in Moscow. Hello? Hello, Aunt Louisa, this is Claudia. Oh, I'm fine. And how are you? And your asthma? It's a lot better. I'm so glad. For dinner? You'd like us to come for dinner next Wednesday? It's Claudia, I was only fooling. It's April Fool. April Fool? Oh, no, I wasn't talking to you, Aunt Louisa. Uh, it's awfully sweet of you to ask us for dinner, and we'll be there on Wednesday. I'm so glad your asthma's better. Goodbye. Mama, you ungrateful mother playing a joke like that on your own daughter. In the first place, I didn't play it on you. You insisted on playing it on yourself. In the second place, you'll have a lovely dinner. I'd just forgotten completely that it was April Fool's Day. I wonder if David remembers. I want nothing to do with whatever comes out of that look on your face. I bet he's forgotten all about it, too. Mm, I wish I hadn't reminded you. Yes, you had a wonderful time filling my house with imaginary soup terrines. <laughs> and now you just don't want me to have fun, too. Oh, I don't think David would care very much about soup terrine. What does he care most about? I know. Our house in the country. Claudia, I don't think you'll be able to fool David for a minute. Oh, won't I? I can keep the straightest face you ever saw. Mm. You may be able to keep a straight face, but I never heard of you keeping a secret. Well, I'll keep this one all right, just long enough. I'll tell David that Mr. Paradiso called, and we won't be able to move into the house on April 15th. When do the new tenants move into this apartment? April 15th, that's the whole point. We won't have anywhere to go, and, and I'll get David to start calling up all the hotels to get a reservation. That sounds more like an April Fool's joke on the hotels than it does on David. I love to stay in a hotel. I love to. In a minute, you'll forget this is a joke. Can't you just picture how excited he's going to be when he hears? <laughs> I can picture it exactly. He'll say, April Fool. <laughs> they won't believe you for a minute. His nostrils will wiggle and he'll put down his pipe and he'll say all kinds of things about Paradiso. And you and I aren't going to open our mouths until he's made a dozen telephone calls. Just one thing, Claudia. I'm not a party to this. I don't know a thing about it. Of course not, neither do I. That's the whole point. There's David now. Quick, start fixing my dress. <whistles> Hello, David. I wish I could whistle back, but Mama has pins in her mouth. David, listen, I've got something to tell you before... Darling, before you tell me anything, I've got something important to tell you. You have? Yes. Maybe you'd better sit down. And Mama, take the pins out of your mouth. Mm? Me sit down? Maybe you'd better. Because I'm afraid this is going to be a terrible disappointment to you. Whatever it is, it sounds terrible. Mama, you better take the pins out of your mouth. Mm? Now, how can I tell you? Let me see. Darling. Yes? Darling, would you mind having to live in a hotel for a while? In a hotel? No, no, no. Don't say they're expensive, because there are times when you just can't help the expense. David, what are you trying to say? My dear woman, I had a phone call today. Is that unusual? From Eastbrook. That's not unusual. From... Paradiso. Paradiso? And this was the message. The house will not be ready for us to move into on the 15th of April. The house won't be ready by the... David, did you say that Paradiso said the house wouldn't be ready? Yes. That, my darling, is exactly what I said. That's what I thought you said. 
Ah, um, is that what you thought he said? That's what I thought he said. I was right. You are a sport, darling. I, I knew. I just knew that you would take it standing up. I'm practically not standing up. Darling, it's not so tragic. We'll we'll have a nice vacation in a in a hotel. But I don't want a hotel. I want to move into our house. Mama, I had a feeling. Just before David came, when you and I... I I'm putting the pins back in my mouth. You don't have to now. David, when did he call? No, uh, when did he call? Uh, now, let me see. And just exactly what did he say? Uh, what did he say? Now, now let me see. Uh, just, just how soon after the 15th can we move in? Well, he didn't exactly say. He didn't say. Oh, no. that's a terrible sign. It probably won't be for weeks. Oh, maybe just a day or two. He ought to pay, David. Paradiso ought to pay for while we're in a hotel. Paradiso? Now, come, darling. It's not the Paradiso. Well, if he doesn't pay, somebody else should, should have to pay. Why do we always have to be the ones who pay and pay and pay? Because you're a woman. <laughs> I've half a mind to call that Paradiso and give him a piece of my... The other half of your mind. David, I don't understand you at all. You don't seem to care at all. Well, darling, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Oh, you will, if you have no place to sleep. Remember what happened the last time we tried to get a room in a hotel? I remember. That reminds me. You had better start calling right away and make reservations or else... I'm not moving out of my apartment again, thank you. You're welcome. You're right, David. We'll start calling right now. Where's the phone book? In the bedroom. I'll get it. Don't move, darling. I'll, I'll get it. Mama, isn't it terrible? That's what you get for trying to play jokes on people. Oh, that's different. With me, it was a joke. With David, it's serious. Oh, it's not that serious, Claudia. You spend a day or two in a hotel, you'll love it. I love it when it's by choice, not by necessity. Well, darling, I, I admire your spirit. You do? Mm-hmm. I was just thinking I didn't have any. I behaved much worse about it than you did when I heard about it. Darling, now come to think of it, I'm, I'm not really as upset as I seem. It'll give us more time to move. I can get the furniture arranged before we move in. Mm -hmm. And we won't have to move out of one place and into another all the same day. You know, I'm starting to think it's much better this way. You know, I think so, too. You, uh, you do? Absolutely. I'm really very pleased the way things turned out. And I'm going to call the Slater this minute and get ourselves a reservation. Uh, this minute? We can't waste any time. Well... Tomorrow will do. Never put off till tomorrow. What you can do today, I always say. You always say. Always, didn't you know? Now, what's that number? Let's see. Here we are. Murray. Are Hill. you uh, uh, you sure it's the uh, Slater you want to call? Mm, yes. I'll, I'll answer it. Oh, I'm right here. I've got it. Hello? This is Mrs. Norton. Mr. Paradiso? It's Mr. Paradiso. Speaking of the devil. Uh, uh, let me uh, talk to him, Claudia. Yes, Mr. Paradiso. The house will... You mean you've got some more news since you called my husband this morning? Uh, <clears throat> I think I'd uh, better talk to him, dear. What? You didn't call this morning. Are you sure this is the first time you're calling you today? You should have let me talk to Claudia, him. Claudia, I suspect that... Yes, Mr. Uh, Paradiso. Claudia, I, uh... It was all a joke, Claudia. Yes, Mr. Paradiso, not until the 17th or 18th. And you'll let us know. It was just a joke, Claudia. It was a wonderful joke, David. What did you say was the number of the Slater Hotel? Young lady, if you think you can pull my leg, your joke has gone too far. Mama, you're right. It's gone much too far. That was Mr. Paradiso on the phone. And his message was that the furnace will be delayed until the 14th, and we won't be able to move up to the farm until at least three or four days after that. What did you say, Claudia? Three or four days? That's Claudia. That's what I said. Are you joking? Do I sound like I was joking? You and your April fool. Fine kind of a joke to play on a person unsuspecting. No, 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 operator. I didn't say April fool. At least I, I, I said it, but I, I wasn't talking to you. I want to talk to the room clerk. Yes, I'll wait. Many of us have had to deny ourselves certain of the good things of life lately because they've gone up so in price. But there's one thing we can all still enjoy... And that's ice-cold Coca-Cola. 
Coke was five cents in 1886, and it's still five cents today. Yet it's the self-same delicious drink it always has been. The drink you relish whenever you want, the pause that refreshes. Well, Mr. King, Claudia and her April fooling should teach somebody a lesson. But I don't know who or what. (laughs) Well, the lesson's not important, Mrs. Brown. Just having fun. And I wouldn't take that hotel too seriously. I think they'll be going to the country as planned. Oh, but don't let them think they're the only ones going anyplace. I understand uh, Julia and Hartley are leaving for London tomorrow. So Claudia said. And she and David are seeing them off at the boat. That ought to be exciting. I hope the boat doesn't leave with uh, them on board. I'd certainly miss them. (laughs) So would I, Mr. King. Well, goodbye. Uh, Goodbye, Mrs. Brown. And as I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For ice-cold Coca-Cola makes any pause, the pause that refreshes. Claudia has come to most of you now for the past six months. We'd welcome any suggestion or anything you may wish to say about our show. Write to Claudia, post office box number 173, Church Street Station, New York 8, New York. Now let me repeat, write to Claudia, post office box number 173, Church Street Station, New York 8, New York. And now here's a word from your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Ah, for the days when there was a friendly neighbor that bottled Coca-Cola. We remember those days well here on Classic Radio Theater. Yes, Claudia, uh, from 76 years ago, April 1st, 1948. And thank you so much for making us a part of your day. On our April 2nd program, we will have Crime with Nick Carter, also Bob Bailey and Let George Do It with Virginia Gregg, uh, Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce, and the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, an episode of Gangbusters, and Superman. That's coming up next time we get together on a Tuesday. Have yourself a great Monday and a great week ahead, and we will see you next time you listen to Classic Radio Theater. I'm Wyatt Cox.